This manhwa commenced with Princess Anyer who finds herself at the entrance of a grand castle, where she is about to enter into an arranged marriage with a man she has never met. The crowd outside admires her beauty, but Princess Anyer is visibly nervous and unsure of what awaits her. As she walks down the stairs, her eyes widen in shock, as she comes face to face with her husband, Cashin, the Archduke of Terranugen. Cashin greets her with respect and claims that they have met before. Princess Anyer is taken aback and realizes that she has been deceived. Regret fills her as she realizes the mistake she made by agreeing to the marriage setting the stage for a difficult relationship between them. The story then takes a flashback to three months ago, during the West Empire's annual party. Princess Anyer, feeling unwell due to drinking with the knights the previous night, looks out the window and sees people enjoying themselves at the party. She desperately wants to skip the event, but her mother had threatened her earlier, warning that she would be killed if she dared to miss the party. Anyer, contemplating her options and determined to meet the emperor in secret, decides to hide from her angry mother. She imagines her mother chasing after her on a wild horse, filled with fury. Knowing the dire consequences of encountering her mother, Anyer devises a plan to divert her attention. By having her mother ask the emperor about her whereabouts, she spots another building within the castle and slides against the castle wall, making her way towards it. With the belief that the emperor is on the third floor, Anyer swiftly jumps towards the building, landing on a balcony. However, her arrival doesn't go unnoticed, as a silver-haired man inside the building, dressed as a gentleman and wearing a mask, notices her presence. Cashin, for that is his name, is surprised to see Anyer and asks her who she is. Lost in her own thoughts and preoccupied with her mission, Anyer barely registers Cashin's question or his identity. She wonders about his identity for a brief moment but quickly refocuses, realizing that she doesn't have time for introductions. Ignoring Cashin, she jumps away from him, leaving him taken aback by her sudden disappearance. Soon after Cashin's knights appear, reacting to the commotion caused by Anyer's presence, they tell him that they heard something and ask if he's alright. Cashin turns back to see them and assures them that it was nothing. He smiles and tells them it was just a cute little thieving cat. Meanwhile, Anur frowns and wonders who the man is but she shrugs it off, finding his identity to have nothing to do with her. As Anyer peeks through the window on the third floor, she finds the hallway empty, providing her with a stroke of luck. Stepping inside, she sees an abandoned mask and seizes the opportunity to disguise herself. She quickly puts on the mask and blends in with the partygoers. Shortly after, a woman arrives and discovers her missing mask. She begins questioning others about its whereabouts, unaware that Anyer is the one responsible. Taking advantage of the distraction, Anyer discreetly slips away, navigating through the crowd. She spots the West Empire Supreme Emperor, her superior and uncle, Shikri on the fourth, surrounded by respectful nobles. However, her attention is diverted when she catches sight of her furious mother, the Duchess of Frihita. Gasping, Anyer realizes that her mother is searching for her. Feeling a sense of panic, Anyer quickly makes her escape, avoiding her mother's gaze. Million, a woman nearby, asks the Duchess if her inability to find Anyer is because they are at a masquerade party. The Duchess, with a bitter chuckle, confirms that she doubts her daughter even knows it's a masquerade party. She appears on the side of the room where Anur is, to Anyer's dismay. It seems as though her mother is deliberately following her. Desperate to avoid a confrontation, Anyer hides behind a pillar, hoping to evade her mother's notice. However, it appears that the Duchess has caught on and is closing in on Anyer's hiding place. As Million moves closer under the Duchess's instruction, Anyer's whole body trembles with fear of being caught. She closes her eyes, preparing for the worst, but suddenly, she hears a voice calling her a thieving cat. Opening her eyes, she sees the silver-haired man from before standing beside her, draping his red cape over her. She looks at him in surprise, and asks if he is the same person she saw earlier. Cashin, putting his finger to his lips, urges her to be quiet. The Duchess arrives and apologizes for interrupting them. She is about to inquire about Cashin's companion but he claims that Anyer is shy. The Duchess politely laughs it off and tells them to enjoy their date before leaving with Million. Anyer breathes a deep sigh of relief, grateful for not being caught by her mother. Turning to face Cashin, Anyer wonders if he truly intended to help her. Cashin asks if she found what she was looking for, 
prompting Anya to ask him what exactly she was searching for. He cryptically tells her that she was an uninvited guest. Anya is taken aback by his lack of understanding, and realizes that explaining the situation to him will be challenging. Curiosity gets the better of her, and Anya asks Cashin why he is allowing her to stay, if he knows she wasn't invited. Cashin smiles and confesses that he was merely intrigued. Blushing, Anya wonders who this man is, and assumes he must be a foreigner, since he doesn't recognize her. Cashin further explains that he is a man whose interest was piqued by a thieving cat. Anya crosses her arms and questions if he called her a thieving cat, simply because she jumped over the railing. Cashin chuckles in response to her query. Before Anya can say anything more, she suddenly feels an overwhelming urge to vomit, and decides it's best to leave. She thanks Cashin for his help, and vows to repay the debt someday. She unpins her badge from her suit and hands it to him before hastily turning to leave. Once Anya is gone, Cashin smiles and gazes at the badge in his hand. A man approaches him and asks what it is. Cashin admits he isn't entirely sure, but speculates that it is probably a cat's treasure. The man is surprised to see Cashin in a good mood and questions him about it. Cashin mentions that the emperor is looking for him, alerting the man to the urgency of the matter. Cashin, after a moment's pause, agrees to go along with the emperor's plan. He acknowledges that the West Empire, where they currently are, is more prosperous and wealthy compared to his home the North Empire. Cashin attributes this abundance to the presence of the Sword Master of Rulgosa, a prestigious title held by only about 100 individuals in history. Most of these Sword Masters hail from the West Empire and have played crucial roles in saving the Empire from destruction. Seated with the Emperor and sipping tea, Cashin expresses his desire to meet the renowned Sword Master personally, as everyone praises their skills. The West Emperor laughs and informs him that the Sword Master doesn't make appearances even for the Emperor himself. Cashin sets down his tea, and observes that the Sword Master effortlessly disregards the Emperor's orders. The Emperor acknowledges Cashin's observation, and admits that he too, likes to boast about the Sword Master, but there's nothing he can do about it. In reality, the Emperor is well aware of the true identity of the Sword Master. It is Princess Sanyar. However, he cannot disclose this information to Cashin due to his fear of the Duchess, Anyer's mother. If the fact that Anyer is the sword master were to become known to foreign countries, the emperor would face severe reprimand from the Duchess. Additionally, the Duchess might accuse him of hindering her daughter's marriage plans. The emperor can vividly imagine the intimidating expression on the Duchess's face. Suddenly, Cashin hears a voice emanating from the balcony below, and spots the Duchess angrily dragging Anyer by her ear. Anyer yelps in pain while the Duchess pays no attention and scolds her as a naughty girl. Cashin smiles, thinking that Anyer has finally been caught. The emperor notices Cashin's sudden disinterest, and continues discussing the intermarriage between their empires. He asks Cashin if he has found someone he likes, revealing the plan to host several parties in the coming days, to find a suitable match for Cashin. This union would strengthen the friendship between the North and West Empires. The Emperor reassures Cashin that any woman would be acceptable, and he encourages him to speak freely. As Cashin sips his tea, he casually tells the Emperor that he wasn't sure about his preferences in a potential partner, as long as she met the required standards. However, he adds with a mischievous grin, that the more interesting the woman, the better. He then recalls his earlier encounter with Anya, and how she had promised to repay her debt to him. This sparks an idea in Cashin's mind. With a wide smile, Cashin reveals the badge he received from Anya to the Emperor. He confidently declares that he wants this lady as his potential partner. The Emperor's mouth drops open in shock as he realizes that it's Anya's badge. Anya's true identity is that of a hero in their country, the spearhead of the Western Empire's military, and the revered captain of the Golden Dragon Knights. She is the sword master whom everyone looks up to. However, despite her prestigious position and accomplishments, Anya is considered a nuisance at home because she hasn't gotten married yet. The Duchess, her mother, interrupts Anya's thoughts and scolds her, emphasizing that young women her age are already finding love and getting married. She mentions an example of Ariel, who is engaged to an account from a neighboring country. Despite her mother's constant nagging and societal pressure, Anya remains firm in her resolve not to marry. The Duchess then asks her if she knows what people call her. Anya boldly declares herself as a hero and a swordmaster, but when she jokingly suggests that people may call her the crazy dog, her mother becomes visibly upset. As the Duchess continues their conversation, 
She confirms that Anyer is indeed known as the Empire's crazy dog. She remarks that whenever marriage proposals are made, Anyer ends up beating the suitors too near death causing them to throw a fit. Anya proudly sighs and addresses those men as weaklings, further solidifying her reputation as a formidable warrior. However, her prideful reaction prompts her mother to slap her on the back with a force that even hurts a swordmaster. Seated on a chair, the Duchess expresses her genuine desire for Anya to experience love. Anya massages her stiff shoulders and questions whether love is the sole determinant of a woman's happiness. The Duchess explains that happiness can be derived from various sources, and if Anya finds contentment in her current way of life, she should hold on to it. Nevertheless, she expresses her concern that Anya hasn't shown any effort in dating. Anya furrows her brow as she processes her mother's words of advice regarding dating. The Duchess then drops a surprising piece of information she reveals that the emperor is worried about Anya and has decided to find her a suitable marriage partner. Anya is taken aback and asks who the chosen candidate is. The Duchess informs her that it is the Archduke of Terran Eugen from the Northern Empire. This revelation shocks Anya into speechlessness. The Duchess continues by mentioning rumors about the Archduke being the best groom candidate in the North. Anya's fury rises, and she questions her mother's seriousness in marrying her off to a foreign land. The Duchess coldly states that she will proceed with the marriage, because there isn't any man within their empire who would be willing to marry Anya. This declaration fuels Anya's anger, and she asks why she should marry a man whom she doesn't even know. However, the Duchess challenges her by asking if she would marry anyone, if they didn't follow this course of action, leaving Anya momentarily hesitant, and indicating her mother's victory in the matter. The Duchess smiles and asks Anya to meet the man first, get to know him for real, and then decide. She further adds that it's been said that he's very handsome. Anya turns gloomy to which the Duchess asks her cheekily, if she doesn't want her husband to be handsome. This causes Anya to blush, and she angrily says that she won't meet anyone regardless of who it is. However, three days later her mother reminds Anya that it's the perfect marriage proposal. A week later, the Duchess also tells her about the man's reputable family and his probability of being a good partner. Anya retries to ignore her mother, but about two weeks later, her mother blackmails her by saying it was her last wish. Anya finally gives up and confirms to her mother that she will meet the suitor. On the day of the meeting, Anya got all dressed up. Her mind was filled with all kinds of thoughts. She thought about marrying abroad too with a foreigner. Even though she has not been married yet, marrying a foreigner risked her freedom. She knows she has no choice but to meet him now. As the Duchess notices her daughter, she exclaims happily and praises her as pretty. And your complexion darkens at the compliment. She thoughts making the other party reject her by turning the tables around. The meeting's venue belongs to the royal family and is to take place in a parlor. A servant guides Anya and her mother towards the location. Anya asks the maid if her mother will be present as well, to which she replies that her mother, along with her father and the emperor, will be present. Anya turns glum as she thinks about how getting rejected while everyone is present, is equivalent to suicide. While her mother conversed with the maid about the pretty interior decor, a newer knew not all hope was lost. Anya notice is a window, and decides she could just disappear from there. Her mother looks at her with widened eyes, but she tries to hide her true expression in front of the maid, by swinging her paper fan over her mouth. Soon, a room disappears from sight turning her mother furious. Anya was now outside. She notices a carriage appearing. She runs towards it as she thinks of how luck was on her side. As the carriage door opens, Anura is startled to find Kashin inside. They exchange surprise glances, and Kashin jokingly asks if she's wandering again like a thieving cat. Anura realizes that he is the same person she met at the party, and nods in recognition. The timing of their encounter seems almost too coincidental. Just as they process the situation, Anura hears her mother's voice approaching in the distance. Acting quickly, she hops onto the carriage and Kashin watches her with amusement. Anura requests the carriage to start moving, eager to put some distance between herself and her mother. Kashin remarks that Anura looks like a noblewoman running away from an unwanted marriage. He assures her that she can make use of him, implying that he's willing to help her in her escape. Anura, feeling confused, doesn't fully grasp his intentions. She wonders why he has been assisting her ever since their last encounter, 
and contemplates whether he knows her true identity. Anura begins to glare at Kashin suspiciously, questioning if he could be a con artist seeking a reward for helping her. Caught off guard by her serious expression, Kashin is taken aback. However, he maintains a smile and assures her that he doesn't want anything from her. Feeling a bit awkward about their current situation, Anura hesitates on asking for further assistance. Suddenly, an idea strikes her and she widens her eyes as she proposes that Kashin become her lover for just one day, if he truly wants to help her. Kashin grins in response and agrees to play along. The carriage starts moving, and they navigate through the local streets together. Anura peeks outside and asks Kashin where they are going. He tells her that they are going on a date, surprising Anura with his response. Kashin's mischievous grin prompts Anura to look at him in surprise and confirm that she didn't ask him to be her lover. Kashin explains that it would be more effective if many people saw them together as lovers. By creating a public display, Anura's mother would likely hear about it and call off the wedding. He suggests that the more people witness their relationship, the stronger the impact will be in dissuading her mother's plans. His idea suddenly clicks in Anya's mind, and she realizes the whole act was just for the sake of annulling the marriage. Kashin smiles at her excitement and informs her that it is now time for them to get off. They sat down at a dessert shop, and Kashin presented her with a famous dessert. Anura looks at it closely, since a battlefield has always been more important to her than a dessert. Kashin notices some girls gossiping about Anya, and overhears them calling him her handsome lover. The girls also contemplate asking Anya to introduce them to him causing Kashin's face to turn serious. As Anya takes a bite, she finds the dessert delicious. Seeing a piece of cream on her face, Kashin extends his hands towards his face and cleans it off. This shocks Anura. Kashin goes on to lick the cream and remarks that it's as delicious as it's rumored to be. He smiles and explains to Anura that it was the fastest way to be known as someone's lover. The women present in the dessert shop all turned to look at them in surprise. Anya clutched her fork tightly, and her mouth fell open in shock. She thinks of Kashin Kashin as a crazy guy. They go back, and Anya thanks Kashin for helping her. Anya mentally snickers as she thinks of how the date exceeded her expectations, since there will be rumors now of her going out with a guy, and her marriage will definitely be annulled. Kashin grins and reminds her that she owes him a lot. He then asks if she really hates getting married that much. Anya tells him that her parents had arranged it for her. More than that, the Archduke had such a position that he could have gotten married more than once. She took advice from her married sister if he really hadn't married anyone over the past years. Her sister tells her that there might be something wrong with him, or that he must have a mistress. Anya further confesses to Kashin that it didn't bother her that her marriage partner was perfect. But most importantly, the idea of going abroad and living with foreigners is what troubles her. It was the first time Kassane was being treated like a nuisance and she says that her wishes have come true. Meanwhile, the rumors of Arun having a very handsome lover spread like wildfire. This made Anya certain that the marriage would have been annulled, but it didn't. Instead, her mother assured her that she could marry her secret lover if she wanted to. She tells her she isn't angry at her for running away, and advises her to ignore the scandals. Her words made a nurse sweat profusely. The Duchess continued that she didn't want anything over the top, and was fine as long as she got married. Anya is surprised to see her plan backfire. She decided to answer her mother straightforwardly. She confesses that she doesn't want to get married. The Duchess is taken aback by her daughter's words. She quietly sits down and offers a newer deal. She calmly asks her to get married for three months, and if she doesn't like her partner, she can get a divorce. But the Duchess offers her a condition. She asks Anya to lead a quiet life for those three months. If she still doesn't like it after all that hard work, the Duchess promised her that she wouldn't ask her to get married again. Anya instantly nods, confident that she can endure marriage for at least three months. Her mother further explains that she can't hit or kill anyone or just blast them off. Anur beams and promises her mother that she will try. However, in reality, she thinks of just killing her partner to return home. Anur's marriage was thus finalized. The news of her marriage lifted the atmosphere of the Western Empire. Everyone was shocked to hear that Anya was getting married. On the other hand, all the knights had gathered in the Emperor's throne room. They were protesting against Anur's marriage 
marriage abroad. They claimed it was a huge loss to the empire's military forces. However, the emperor left it to Anyer. Concurrently, the news had spread to the northern empire as well. All the noble women were devastated to hear about Kashin's marriage. Kashin was both the emperor's son and the second in line to the throne. In terms of marriage, he's a man who everyone would choose over the crown prince as he was chosen by society as number one. The seat of the Archduchess of Terror and Eugene, which many young ladies coveted, is now occupied. New tides were about to approach the Northern Empire. Kashin who was involved remained calm. As he scribbled on a piece of paper in his office, he asked his assistant if there was anything else to report. The assistant tells him there is nothing. Kashin closes his eyes as he remembers Shikri on the fourth's reaction when he told him that he wanted to marry Anur. As Kashin tapped his pen repeatedly on the desk, the assistant confessed that there was something that bothered him. The assistant's worried tone catches Kashin's attention, and he asks what it was. The assistant tells Kashin that a huge troublemaker lies in the dukedom of Brahiat, known as the Empire's crazy dog. He further says that it was hard to obtain information on the Duke of Brahiat, but it seems his identity is attributed to the crazy dog. He further tells him that he heard the dog bite to death if one says something wrong. Kashin places his hand on his head as he thinks about how a newer has such a violent family member, and wonders if that's the reason she became a tomboy. He smiles at the thought of her, but is brought back to reality, as the assistant informs him that the airship is about to arrive. Kashin stands up to leave for the airship, thinking about how Anur will make a funny face if she sees him again. In the meantime, Anur's nanny informs her that the airship is about to arrive. Anur nods disinterestedly. The nanny tells her she can't kill or hit someone just because she doesn't like them and especially not use her sword all the time. The nanny continues to babble, advising Anur to speak gently, remain polite and innocent, and put on a smile. It made Anur ponder what her nanny really thinks of her. In the present time, Anur walks out, but freezes as she notices Kashin standing in front of her. All their moments together start to make sense to her. She swiftly turns back and walks away. She informs the nanny that she wants to go back, surprising the nanny who tries to stop her. Kashin steps forward and approaches her. He whispers in Anur's ear, reminding her of her obligation to repay her debt. This makes Anur furious, and she stares at Kashin. Suddenly the nanny shouts to treat the princess like glass, since she's very fragile. Anur is stunned and turned speechless after hearing the nanny's words. Later, the maid started to look for Anur as she had wandered off again. Meanwhile, Anur was hiding in a tree. Kashin could see her from a window and chuckled, wondering how she got up the tree. To him it felt like adopting a cat, not a wife. Anur immediately senses someone staring at her and looks towards the mansion, but finds no one there. She got down, and the maids immediately heard her. She hides behind a tree while the maids run away in the other direction. Soon Kashin approaches her from behind, scaring her. She turns around and asks him how long he has been standing there. Confused as to why she didn't see any sign of him approaching, he tells her he just came. Anura stares at him, wondering if Kashin saw her jump down from a tree. Kashin uses this opportunity to tease her and asks Anura if she really liked him that much. Anura is shocked, as Kashin explains to her that she was looking at him with such a penetrating gaze, that it seemed she liked her face. Anura turns speechless and tries to come up with an explanation, but fails. Kashin changes the topic and asks Anura how she felt after meeting a marriage partner who she thought wouldn't turn out perfect. She tells him it wasn't as bad as she thought. Anura contemplates whether to ask him if he has a mistress or not. The sudden silence between them makes Kashin ask Anur if she was thinking about something else in front of him. His words make a neural blush, and she asks him where he learned such cheesy phrases. She also reminds him that they aren't married yet. Kashin smiles at Anur and tells her it will happen soon. He takes Anura's hand gently and kisses it, telling her it was too late for her to run away. For the time being, the happenings at Terran Eugen Castle were more boisterous than ever before. Maids and other servants were rushing all over the place, trying to get things done swiftly and accurately. There was only one reason for that. It was due to the fact that today is the castle owner's wedding day. Anura's nanny cried as Anura was getting ready for the big day. She weeps for the Duchess to witness this, but Anura reminds her that she remains alive. Her mother, who could be perceived within a crystal ball, 
also states that she is very much alive. The Duchess admits her desire to personally attend her daughter's wedding, but Inora assures her that she can still observe it through the crystal ball. She informs Inora that her uncle, the Emperor, has traveled to the Northern Empire to attend the wedding in person. This startles Inora, as it will undoubtedly lead to her divorce, making the aftermath challenging to handle. Soon, Inora is prepared to become a bride. The maids excessively praise her beauty. Yet all Inora can contemplate is the prospect of entering into a loveless union. The Duchess congratulates Inora on gaining a new family, causing her to realize that she is doing this for her mother's happiness. Meanwhile, a gathering of aristocrats has assembled within the wedding hall. Cashin's assistant ponders the situation, finding the suddenness of the impending marriage rather overwhelming. The crowd busily engages in gossip about the newlywed. Some commend her beauty, while others confirm her foreign origin. Presently, the hall doors swing open as the announcer proclaims the arrival of the bride and groom. The nobles gaze upon them with admiration, and Noor was busy thinking whether this marriage was really the right choice to make. The two stood upon the stage, facing one another, while the priest requested their vows. Initially, he inquired of the bride if she swears to love the groom eternally. The word eternally scares Anura as she contemplates whether uttering a false pledge is permissible. Despite her reservations, she agrees, and the priest proceeds to ask Kashin, who also obliges without hesitation. Then, the priest proclaims that they must vow their eternal love with a kiss. Anura becomes bewildered and blushes as Kashin approaches him. He suggests that she run away if she desires to abandon this union presenting it as her final opportunity. Anura reminds him, with a touch of sadness, that he previously claimed it was too late to escape. Kashin smiles and assures her that it is already too late. He takes hold of Anura's waist and kisses her. The wedding hall erupts with cheers and applause. Subsequently, the priest declares them both married. As Anura gazes at Kashin, she realizes that this marriage is destined for doom. It can either be killed or eaten. The wedding reception incites a lively atmosphere in the town of Taranyajin. The maids hastily escort Anura back to her chamber, declaring that her feet should no longer be over exerted. Conversely, Anura feels absent due to the excessive protectiveness of her maids. She contemplates whether it is acceptable to be in such a state, for she is not weak. Anura recalls the earlier kiss with Kashin, causing her cheeks to flush, as she furiously shakes her head. She resolves to forget it and enters her new chamber. As she surveys her surroundings, she discovers that the room exceeds her expectations. It is vast and opulent. Anura settles upon the bed, deciding to rest comfortably now. Fatigued, she wearily closes her eyes, reflecting upon the events of the day. The maids bid her good night as they depart. All of a sudden, Anura realized why they had wished her a good night quite cheekily. It was her first night with her husband. In the previous part of this series, Princess Anor was arranged to marry Archduke Kashin, a foreigner, by her uncle, the Emperor. Kashin had taken an interest in Anor during the Emperor's party, where he helped her escape from her mother's clutches. Neither Anor nor Kashin were aware that, that they were betrothed to each other at the time. Anyer's mother offers her a deal, knowing her daughter's reluctance to marry. She proposes that Anor marries Kashin for three months and dedicate herself to the marriage. If she doesn't like her husband after that time, she can get a divorce. Anor agrees to this arrangement. Upon reaching the Northern Empire for the wedding, Anor is shocked to discover that Kashin is the one she is supposed to marry. During the wedding, Kashin gives Anor another chance to back out but she decides to go through with it, officially becoming his wife. The story continues with Anya, who is about to have her first night with her husband, Kashin. She is panicking because she fears she might inadvertently hurt him. Anya notices a window and considers it as a possible escape from the situation. She opens the window and contemplates the possibility of using it to flee. However, her plans are interrupted when she hears Kashin's voice asking her what she is doing there. Startled, she turns back and sees Kashin's fiery expression, feeling caught in the act. Kashin repeats his question, causing Anya to stutter as she contemplates whether to pretend to faint or be honest with him. Eventually, when he asks again, Anya decides to tell him that she just wanted some fresh air. However, Kashin questions her motive for wanting fresh air at that hour, and on the windowsill, Anya becomes nervous 
Fearing that her lie has been exposed, Kashin asks her in a serious tone if she is trying to die, catching Anya off guard. She stammers, trying to assure him that she wasn't, even though the thought of falling from the window had crossed her mind. She refrains from revealing the truth about wanting to avoid the first night with him, fearing his reaction. Kashin approaches Anya and extends his hand to help her down from the windowsill. Anya takes his hand, and he asks her to take care of her health. She becomes even more nervous, unable to find an excuse to avoid spending the first night with him. Anya worries that she might become the wife who accidentally harms her husband on their wedding night. When Anya remains silent, Kashin frowns, recalling how Anya's nanny once advised him to treat her delicately like glass because she was fragile. The story unfolds as Kashin takes Anya's hand and leads her away from the windowsill. While he recognizes that she is delicate like glass, he is unaware of her mental struggles and attempts at self-harm. On the other hand, Anya is nervous and contemplates pretending to faint to avoid spending the first night with a stranger. However, before she can execute her plan, Kashin picks her up in his arms and places her gently on the bed, covering her with a blanket. This unexpected kindness leaves Anya overwhelmed and unsure of what to do. Contrary to her expectations, Kashin tells her to get some rest, considering that she might be tired. He gives her a gentle peck on the cheek and advises her not to worry about anything. As Kashin leaves the room, Anya is relieved that her plan worked out, but she is perplexed by the way he treats her, feeling like she's being treated like a child. In the eyes of nobles, marriage is often seen as a tool to strengthen family ties and ensure prosperity. Many people assumed that the marriage of Archduke Terenugin and Anya would be a strategic alliance, until they witnessed the couple at the wedding banquet. Their sweet and affectionate behavior surprised everyone, and the absence of the Archduchess from the banquet on the first day of their wedding deepened the misunderstandings. People began to believe that Kashin genuinely loved Anya, furthering the misconception. However, the reality of their marriage is far from what people believe. The next morning, Kashin observes Anya sleeping in a tree. His assistant, Alan, notices Kashin's expression and wonders if he is developing feelings for Anya. Curious about Anya's actions on their first night, Kashin asks Alan what it could mean when a new bride attempts suicide. Alan is taken aback by the question, but suggests that it could be an indication of the bride's intense dislike for the marriage, to the point where she wishes for death. Kashin sighs, believing that this might be the only possible explanation for Anya's behavior. However, Alan suddenly remembers something and presents an envelope to Kashin. He informs him that the second prince, Mackenzie, had asked him to deliver the invitation to Kashin. Kashin takes the letter and asks if Mackenzie had left immediately after delivering the envelope, to which Alan nods in agreement. He then asks Kashin when he will greet his majesty, to which he replies that he will meet him soon in a sullen manner. After a while, Honora is seen having a tea and talking to her mother through a magic crystal ball. Playfully, her mother asks if she enjoyed her first night, as it must have been quite an event for everyone involved. Honora is caught off guard by her mother's words and ends up choking on her tea. She silently vows to get rid of the magic ball as soon as possible. As the conversation continues, Anor becomes alert when her mother informs her about a riot that has broken out. The Golden Dragon Knights have gone on strike to demand her return. Her mother tells her that the Emperor has requested her assistance in stopping the Knight's strike. This news surprises Anor. The Duchess goes on, mentioning that some of the Knights have already broken contact causing the emperor to feel sad and disappointed. She also reminds Anur that she hasn't responded to the emperor's call. Anur retorts that if the emperor can't reach her, he can call Uncle Sarno instead. Her mother asks if she has met Duke Sarno yet, to which Anur lies, saying she hasn't because she is too busy. In reality, she is just avoiding meeting him because of her laziness. She remembers the knights are on strike and gets angry, imagining their reactions to her marriage. Suddenly a maid calls Anur. The maid points behind her to several presents and informs Anur that they have been sent by Kashin. Her mother says through the magic ball that he must be very romantic and like Anur. However, Anur wonders if Kashin sent these presents because he misunderstood her suicide. Suddenly she gets an odd feeling, as if someone is looking at her. She abruptly looks in that direction and finds a red-haired man waving at her. He comes out of the bushes, and Anur recognizes the man as Craven. 
Her eyes widen and her mouth opens wide in shock as she wonders how he is here instead of the Western Empire. Anur places a hand on her head and grimaces. She hadn't invited the knights to the wedding ceremony to hide her true identity, but Craven has arrived here. She wonders if he's real. Just then, Craven starts waving his hand again and smiles at her cheerfully, making her realize he's real. She decides to chase him away before people start to notice him. As her servants check out the presents from a distance, she whispers to Craven to leave immediately. Craven smiles and whispers back that he doesn't want to. His defiance angers Anor more. She stands up, deciding to chase him away herself. All of a sudden, she senses a powerful energy approaching from behind and becomes concerned. Turning around to identify the source, she stumbles as her heel gets tangled in her dress, causing her to lose balance. Anticipating a fall, she closes her eyes, but to her relief, someone catches her just in time. It turns out to be Kashin, who wears a reassuring smile while asking if she is okay. Anur's cheeks flush with embarrassment. She wonders if Kashin possesses great power, as she hasn't been able to sense him since the last time they met. This raises the question of whether he is also aware of her true identity as a sword master, considering that masters can recognize one another. Meanwhile, Kashin smiles at her, likening her to a cat whose fur is bristling. He helps Anura regain her footing and inquires about her activities. Kashin then signals the servants to depart, and they bow respectfully before leaving. Suspiciously studying Anura, he watches as she laughs nervously, claiming that she wasn't doing anything. Anura tries to divert his attention by questioning why he is there. However, he evades her query and asks whether she liked the gift he gave her. Anura is taken aback by the unexpected question. She later notices the gifts he had sent and recalls them. Kashin is hurt by her apparent lack of interest. Anya approaches the pile of gifts and forcefully expresses her affection, telling Kashin that she loves them. Hoping to dispel any suspicion, she tries to maintain a facade, but Kashin is already aware of her true feelings towards the presence. Suddenly, he notices movement in the bushes behind Anya, but his attention is diverted by a voice addressing him as his son-in-law. Turning to the table, he sees the magic crystal ball, which belongs to the Duchess Anor's mother. Anya realizes that her mother is also present. Kashin promptly shows respect by bowing to the Duchess and introduces himself. The Duchess compliments Kashin's handsome appearance, causing embarrassment to Anya. In return, Kashin pays compliments to the Duchess, comparing her beauty to Anya's. This flattery makes Anya blush intensely. The Duchess continues showering her son-in-law with praise, further fueling Anya's anger. Anya implores her mother to stop but the Duchess persists in her admiration of Kashin. Frustrated with her mother's actions, Anya decides to abruptly turn off the magic ball, knowing that her mother won't stop her compliments. She plans to deal with the magic ball later. Anya apologizes to Kashin, but he reassures her that her mother appeared to be in good spirits. Anya raises her eyebrows, surprised at Kaisen's misinterpretation of her mother's demeanor. Swiftly changing the subject, she asks him why he is there when he should be working. Kashin once again ignores her question and inquires about her well-being. Anur becomes puzzled, but then realizes he is referring to the incident from the previous day. Kassin N. Somberly asks if Nanyar despises the idea of marrying him so much. Anyar is at a loss, unable to find a way to resolve the misunderstanding. Kassin implores her to explain why she acted the way she did so he can assist her. Anyar panics and hastily assures him that it was nothing important. She is unsure of what to say and contemplates revealing the truth, though she finds it too embarrassing. In an attempt to downplay the incident, she raises her hand and explains that it wasn't a significant matter, urging him not to mind it. Kassin pauses for a moment and reluctantly accepts her response. He tells Anura that she can talk to him freely about it if she wants to. Anya looks down and finally decides to confess the truth. As Kashin starts to leave, she reaches out and grabs his cuff to stop him. Kashin is touched by this gesture and looks at Anya curiously. Anya hesitates but eventually reveals that she was scared during their first night together and had contemplated running away. Kashin is taken aback by her admission of wanting to run away. Anya closes her eyes, nervous about how he will react. Kashin repeats her words, acknowledging that their first night had been frightening for her, leading her to consider running away. Unexpectedly, he starts laughing and teasingly calls Anya cute. This compliment causes her to blush. He places a comforting hand on her shoulder and softly whispers that if she didn't want to be intimate with him on their first night, 
he wouldn't have forced her. His understanding response touches Anya, and she asks if he truly means it. Cashin smiles and puts a finger to his lips, implying that it's a secret between them. Remembering how Cashin had acted similarly before, encouraging her to make use of him, Anya finds his offer suspicious. Additionally, his demeanor makes him appear like a powerful individual. Anya decides to investigate him further, but for the time being, she puts those thoughts aside and flashes a smile at Cashin, since she achieved what she wanted. Cashin then returns to his office, leaving Anya to contemplate the situation further. He laughs as he thinks about Anor's confession from their first night. To him, she didn't seem the type to get scared like that. Ellen stares at Cashin and wonders why he is suddenly laughing like that questioning his sanity. He calls Cashin. Cashin turns to face Alan, and when asked about the matter, Alan lashes out in frustration. Eventually, Cashin calls Alan, who bows respectfully and asks if he needs anything. Cashin, currently occupied with writing a letter, informs Alan that there is a rat hiding in the palace and instructs him to find and exterminate it. Meanwhile, in the garden, a commotion ensues as the headmaid discovers that the crystal ball has been destroyed. All the other maids gather around as well. One of the maids remarks that an average person wouldn't have been capable of breaking such an enchanted magic ball. The headmaid furiously demands to know who is responsible for breaking the crystal ball. Meanwhile, Anya sits peacefully sipping her tea, knowing that she was the one who smashed the crystal ball when no one was looking. Suddenly, she hears a voice filled with tears, asking for forgiveness. It is one of the maids, tearfully confessing that she was in charge of the crystal ball and apologizing for not being more vigilant. However, the headmaid scolds her harshly for breaking such a valuable object, asserting that the maid wouldn't be able to afford to pay for the magic ball even if she worked in the palace for 10 years. Anya observes the headmaid scolding the maid with anger and addresses her as Nanny. She inquires about the maid's fate, and the nanny informs her that the maid will be dismissed for breaking something valuable. Moreover, the maid will have to repay her debt, and due to the seriousness of her mistake, no other family will likely hire her. Hearing this, Anya begins to feel guilty. Anya steps forward and approaches the commotion, asking the maid what is happening. She understands that she needs to resolve the conflict since she was the one who caused it. The headmaid tries to reassure Anya, telling her not to worry as she can handle the situation. However, Anya insists that it is her concern since the incident occurred within her palace. Her words surprise both the headmaid and the nanny. The nanny is touched by Anya's sense of responsibility, realizing that Anya has already formed an attachment to the palace. She decides to inform the duchess about this. Anya gazes at the broken pieces of the sphere and advises the headmaid not to make such a fuss over something trivial. Anya wonders if her words will be enough to prevent the maid from being kicked out. As the accused maid, along with the other maids and the nanny, looks at Anya in shock, they realize that their new archduchess is quite merciful. Their prolonged gazes make Anya uneasy, prompting her to turn away. The headmaid asks Anya if it's really okay to ignore the matter, to which Anya smiles and reassures her that it's natural for people to make mistakes, and they can simply buy a new magic ball. She orders the maids to return to their duties, considering the matter resolved. However, the accused maid approaches Anya once again, tearfully pleading for her acceptance of allegiance. This plead catches everyone's attention, and they all stare at her. Anya is surprised by the maid's actions and asks her what she's doing. The maid declares Anya as her savior and vows to repay her kindness until her last breath. This makes Anya feel even more guilty, knowing that she was the one who broke the magic ball in the first place. She tries to calm the maid down, but her attempts are unsuccessful. Suddenly, the nanny calls for the maid's attention and presents a box containing another crystal ball. Inside the ball, the duchess can be seen laughing. The duchess reveals that she anticipated something like this could happen, so she had sent plenty of her magic balls. Anya rolls her eyes at this revelation, realizing that all her efforts to cover up the incident were in vain. Nevertheless, the maid is now calmed. After the incident, the headmaid reports what happened to Alan in Cashin's study. Alan is shocked to hear the details, while Cashin smiles proudly. He hadn't expected Anya to take such an interest in palace matters. As he prepares to leave, both the headmaid and Alan notice him and inquire about his destination. Cashin smiles and informs her that he is going to see his wife. He slams the door behind him, leaving both of them stunned. Cashin wasn't the type to leave while working, and Alan wonders why he has gotten weird. Meanwhile, the accused maid is trying to find Anya to plead her allegiance, 
while Anyer is avoiding her. Anyer sighs, frustrated with always ending up in such situations. Suddenly, she is startled by a voice calling her name, and she turns to see Craven. Anya is shocked to find Craven dressed in a woman's disguise and asks him why. Craven proudly reveals that it's his disguise, leaving Anya speechless. When asked if he is dressed as a maid, Craven nods affirmatively. Anya places her hand on her head, annoyed with his antics, and contemplates the idea of killing him. She questions if anyone has seen him like this to which Craven confidently assures her that nobody noticed, as infiltration and disguise are his specialties. Anyer then inquires about the whereabouts of the knights. Craven explains that he has written his resignation letter and came to see her. His words surprise Anyer, and she asks why he did that. Craven firmly responds that he should be with his commander, Anyer, as it is his noble duty to pledge allegiance to the emperor. Anyer rolls her eyes at his statement and decides to ignore him. She begins to walk away, but Craven chases after her. He makes it clear that despite his pledge to the Emperor, the only person he truly wishes to follow is Anyer, his commander. Anyer continues to ignore Craven's pleas, trying to tune out his curses and frustration. She wishes for him to quiet down and stop bothering her. However, Craven persists, reminding her of the battle where she once saved his life. He questions the nature of their marriage, expressing his dissatisfaction with her pretending to be frail. He demands that she give him back the strong and cool commander she once was. Anya remains indifferent to his outbursts, which only further infuriates Craven. In a fit of anger, he grabs her to face him, reminding her of her victories with the swords evermore and nevermore, and questioning why she is treating her beloved swords so poorly. The forceful confrontation catches Anya off guard, and she frowns at him, ordering him to leave and stop being nosy. She suggests that he should go with Uncle Sarno, who is returning home soon. Craven, however, starts crying and pleads with Anya to let him stay, even if it's just as a maid. At that moment, Craven notices Cashin observing them with a dangerous smile. Cashin questions Anya about what is happening between her and Craven. Anya is taken aback by Cashin's presence and stutters in response, not sure how to explain the situation. Anya is startled by Cashin's sudden appearance and tries to figure out how to introduce Craven to him. Cashin looks at Craven and remarks that it's his first time seeing this maid. Anya quickly agrees with Cashin's statement, but then realizes the implications of what he said. Cashin continues, noting that the maid doesn't appear to be from the Ducal Palace, and Anya quickly comes up with an explanation, saying that she brought the maid from the Western Empire. To her surprise, Cashin acknowledges Craven as a maid, and Anya is relieved that he doesn't see through the disguise. Cashin smiles and accepts her excuse without further questioning. Craven bows and takes his leave, while Anya's handmaiden glares at him as he departs. As Craven leaves, he feels a mix of relief and concern, noticing Cashin glaring at him angrily. He wonders if he's imagining things, as Cashin had been smiling at him before. Nevertheless, he continues on his way, hoping that Cashin hasn't seen through his disguise. Meanwhile, Anya observes Cashin's expression, noticing that he doesn't seem pleased. She musters the courage to ask him if he's upset. Cashin responds by questioning her about the secret conversation she had with the maid Craven. Anya waves her hands, assuring Cashin that there was no secret conversation with the maid. Cashin smiles and expresses his trust in her, relieving Anya. She then asks Cashin if the maid Craven appeared muscular and manly to him. Cashin cautions her, saying it's rude to make assumptions about someone's gender based solely on their outer appearance. Anya agrees and wonders if Craven's disguise was successful. Cashin gazes at her and compliments her eyes, noting their beauty when she's in deep thought. Anya remarks how others have considered her eyes scary, like those of a killer. Cashin insists he is not lying. Anya indeed has the ominous crimson eyes of a killer. She was Rul Ghost's executor and has been seen as a cursed monster because of her bloodshot crimson eyes. Anya reveals that people have always been scared to look her in the eye ever since she was a child. Being born with such eyes, she was considered the family's curse, as usually only one person in each generation possesses such eyes. She further tells Cashin that her grandfather and uncle were both sword masters with crimson eyes. Cashin inquires if her uncle was the one who captured the apocalyptic dragon that awakened 30 years ago, ending the 10-year war with the Eastern Union. Anya hesitates 
but agrees with Kashin, acknowledging that her uncle is indeed a dragon slayer. However, she expresses confusion about the claims that he single-handedly ended the war with the Eastern Union. Anyer describes her uncle as a good person, which brings a smile to Kashin's face. She wonders about the reason behind his smile and addresses him as your highness. This causes Kashin to frown, leaving Anyer uncertain if she said something wrong. Kashin then requests that Anyer call him dear. Anyer is taken aback, as she has never used that word before, and asks why he suddenly wants her to address him like that. Kashin calls her by her name, stirring her emotions. He informs Anyer that he will be calling his wife by her name now, and asks her to do the same with him. Anyer flushes, pondering for a moment, and eventually calls Kashin by his name. He draws her closer and caresses her head, praising her for complying with his request. After some time, Kashin goes back inside and thinks about the maid Craven, who was with Anyer. Based on Anyer's reaction, Craven didn't seem dangerous to him. He smiles cunningly and contemplates the idea of catching him later to interrogate him. Two days have passed since Craven appeared in the palace and it surprises Anyer that no one has commented on his disguise as a woman. She finds it strange, and wonders if her ominous crimson eyes are the reason for this lack of attention. Craven approaches Anyer and inquires if the commander has called for him. Anyer asks Craven to explain how he managed to come to the palace. Craven stands respectfully, stiffening his body, and explains that after Anyer left to get married, the Golden Dragon Knights caused an uproar. Since all the knights act as one unified body, they all went to find Anyer, but she wasn't there. Craven adds that he couldn't imagine the knight staying still after her sudden disappearance. In response to the situation, he proudly informs Anyer that he immediately handed in his resignation letter. Anyer looks at him, finding Craven's behavior odd, and contemplates whether she should tell him the truth about the marriage being only for three months. Craven continues, saying that he also encountered Ergen on his way to submit his resignation letter, and wonders if Ergen also resigned happily. Anyer clenches her teeth in frustration, asking Craven not to say such things cheerfully. As Craven ponders over her words, he notices the accused maid glaring at him from the half-open door. Realizing she's been caught eavesdropping, the maid shrieks, causing both Anyer and Craven to look at her in surprise. Anyer wonders how long the maid has been standing there. Craven gives the maid a cold glare and tells Anyer that he will handle the situation as she is annoying the commander. He starts to walk away, and Anyer's handmaiden yells in shock, asking him what he's about to do. Craven approaches the maid and fully opens the door, giving her a stern look. He informs the maid that Anyer's handmaiden has already accepted his allegiance and urges the maid to pledge her allegiance in the next life. The maid is scared and screams in fear before running away, calling Anyer mean. Craven closes the door and starts to laugh, which irritates Anyer further. She considers the idea of having Craven leave with Uncle Sarno. Later on, Anyer sits outside for tea, and Craven is still present, serving her. Anyer is annoyed by his presence and asks him to leave as she wants to be alone. Craven smiles and reminds her that she will need a maid soon, since she's heading to the capital. He explains that every married noble must follow one rule unconditionally, obtaining the approval of the emperor. The tradition of the emperor presiding over possible conflicts within the family and announcing property inheritance for the nobilities is considered a formality in today's day and age, as perceived by Anyer's handmaiden. Suddenly, a group of angry maids, including the head maid and the accused maid, approach Anyer. Anyer wonders if they have found out that Craven is actually a man, which she finds strange if they haven't discovered the truth yet. The headmaid bitterly glares at Craven, who returns the same look. Anyer stands up and tries to clarify the situation, but the accused maid interrupts and accuses Anyer of being unfair. She reveals that they were with Anyer first and feels hurt to see her getting close to Craven. The maid asks if Anyer favors Craven just because he is from the Western Empire. They claim they promised to train in the West as well hoping Anyer would give them a chance too. Both Anyer and Craven are dumbfounded by the maid's accusations. The headmaid joins in and agrees with the other maids, expressing that it would be unfair for Anyer to favor only one maid. Anyer realizes that their jealousy is solely based on her seemingly close relationship with Craven. She forces a smile and assures them that it wasn't favoritism, confessing that she values and likes all of them. 
Her words touch all the maids, including the headmaid, and the tension begins to ease. They understand that Anya cares for each of them and didn't mean to hurt their feelings. The misunderstanding is resolved, and the maids are reassured of their place in Anya's heart. The maids also confess their fondness for Anya, and she smiles, pleased that her words have had a positive effect on them. A few days later, Anya is ready to depart for the capital. Kaisen advises her not to be nervous, reassuring her that she only needs to give her greetings. He takes her hand and kisses it, causing Anya to blush. Kashin informs Anya that he won't be able to see her for a while, as he needs to complete his work in the palace first. However, he promises to catch up with her soon. Anya tells him that she will leave with Uncle Sarno first. Kashin lovingly caresses her face and gives her a peck on the lips telling her to be content with this gesture if she misses him. As the carriage sets off for the journey, the excited maids nearby gasp and praise the couple for making Anya's cheeks flush even more. Craven, riding on horseback, notices Duke Sarno and smiles, relieved to have some company during the ride. Inside the carriage, Anya sits with her nanny, who praises Craven for being sincere. Anya explains that it was that same spirit that made him the vice commander of the knights. Anya suddenly realizes that this is her first time traveling in a carriage, as she has always ridden a horse. She finds the experience pleasant, enjoying the opportunity to see the surroundings from a different perspective. She suddenly blushes and touches her lips, remembering her kiss with Kashin before they departed. In the previous part of this series, Anya managed to avoid spending her first night with Kashin, which led him to think she was trying to commit suicide due to unhappiness with their marriage. However, the next day, she discovered her empire's knight Craven, disguised as a maid. He vowed to stay by her side and follow her orders, despite the new Ray wanting him to return. Kashin resolved his misunderstanding with Anya, who confessed that she had been scared on their first night and had considered running away. Kashin reassured her that he would never touch her without her consent. Anya became suspicious of Kashin's true identity, believing him to be a powerful individual. Her influence began to grow in the palace, and the maids started to like her. A few days later, Anya departed for the capital with Duke Sarno, her nanny, and Craven. Before leaving, Kashin kissed her goodbye, prompting Anya to realize her feelings for him. The story now starts with Anya, who couldn't help but think of the kiss with Kashin before their departure, but she quickly shook her head dismissing those thoughts as absurd. The nanny and her maid, Erica, looked at her in surprise, wondering about the sudden change in her demeanor. Anya attributed her strange thoughts to being unaccustomed to such calmness. However, her thoughts were interrupted as the carriage suddenly started shaking roughly. Anya instantly became alert, sensing danger. Someone screamed that it was an ambush. Craven, recognizing the seriousness of the situation, immediately ordered the knights to protect Princess Anya and Duke Sarno. The knights quickly surrounded Duke Sarno, who had fallen to the floor, terrified and trying to shield himself. The enemy began to rain arrows upon them, catching them off guard. Craven swiftly ordered the knights to form a defensive formation, trying to counter the ambush. Meanwhile, Kashin was in his office playing chess with Alan. As he moved his knight, he paused and stared at the piece, feeling that something was amiss. Alan inquired what was wrong, and Kashin mentioned that the chess pieces seemed to be getting tangled, wondering if it could signify something. Just then, his butler stormed into the room, delivering urgent news. He informed Kashin that the Archduchess had been ambushed. Kashin remained frozen in shock, his eyes filled with fear, upon hearing the news of the ambush. Meanwhile, Anya observed the smoke bomb surrounding the carriage, realizing they were completely surrounded. She decided to fight back against the attackers. Erica, trembling in fear, vowed to protect Anya with her life. Anya asked for forgiveness, confusing Erica, and swiftly struck her, causing her to collapse. Anya jumped out of the carriage, ignoring the knight's warning that it was dangerous. She used her magic to open a portal and retrieved her sword, nevermore, ready to fight. Kashin, mounted on his horse, hurriedly tried to reach his wife. He felt unusually anxious, and wondered if it was due to losing the carefully earned pawn, or for some other reason he couldn't understand. Meanwhile, Craven noticed Anya with her magnificent sword one of the two legendary swords passed down by the Rule Gosa family. The notorious sword Nevermore, which swallows every soul, was in Anya's possession. She swiftly began to fight the enemy knights, slashing through them with Nevermore. 
Craven was amazed by her power and realized the battle could be won in a single breath with that sword. He watched in astonishment as Anyer fought the enemy knights, who begged for mercy. As she clashed with another knight, he managed to block her attack, but was taken aback by her strength and decided to escape. Anyer swung her sword at him, telling him she couldn't let him live. He fell to the ground in pain, and Anyer sighed. With all enemies defeated, that sword in Anyer's hand addressed Anyer as a contractor and questioned why she suddenly called it that after such a long time. However, Anyer ignored the sword's question and sent it back to the magic portal, finding it too noisy. Craven approached Anyer and explained that they couldn't interrogate the enemies since she hadn't spared anyone. Anyer realized her mistake and walked away calmly, stating that if the enemies had any business with them, they would attack again. Suddenly, Cashin appeared with his knights, surprising both Anyer and Craven. The knights were panning heavily from their haste to reach her. They worriedly asked Anyer if she was unharmed, since she had almost been kidnapped. Anyer stuttered, unable to form a single sentence. Cashin dismounted his horse his expression dark as he stared at Anyer. She couldn't decipher his emotions. He approached her and immediately embraced her, catching her by surprise. Anyer blushed at Cashin's sudden act. He broke from the hug and confessed that he was glad to follow her, just in case. Cashin asked Anyer if she was hurt anywhere, and she shook her head, assuring him that she was all right. Cashin gently rubbed her blood-stained cheek and coldly asked who helped defeat the enemy. Anyer contemplated what she should tell Cashin knowing she couldn't reveal the truth about her actions. Duke Sarno intervened, claiming that Craven was the one who saved Anyer from the attempted kidnapping and defeated the enemies. Anyer and Cashin both looked at Duke Sarno, surprised by his words. Duke Sarno placed his arm around Craven, who looked at him in shock. Craven started sweating, astonished by Duke Sarno's lie. Anyer immediately agreed with Duke Sarno and pointed out that Craven indeed did everything. Craven was taken aback that even his commander was placing all the responsibility on him. Cashin stared at Craven and frowned, asking if he was the one who did it all. Craven looked at the dead bodies and then turned to face Cashin. He scratched his head, attempting to clarify the situation, but noticed Anyer glaring at him angrily, silently warning him not to tell the truth or face dire consequences. Fearful of Anyer's response, Craven reluctantly retaliated and confessed to defeating the enemies all by himself. In the capital of the Northern Empire, Grumium, people couldn't stop talking about the newlywed royal couple. Rumors spread that Cashin proposed to Anyer after falling in love at first sight when they met by chance. One of them raises the concern of Lady Haley, as she has fixed her eyes on marrying Cashin but her companion reassured her that she would have to watch the new couple from the sidelines. They speculated on how the emperor would react to the news of their marriage, although he wasn't quite happy about it. Cashin and Anya arrived in Grumium, with Cashin deciding to accompany her out of concern for her safety. Anya was amazed by the Grand Terran Yujan Ducal Mansion. The mansion's head butler greeted them, and Cashin introduced the butler to Anya, suggesting she could look around the mansion with him to help calm her nerves. Back at the Northern Palace, Duke Sarno was worried about Anya. As he sipped his tea, he pondered what happened a few hours ago after the ambush. He had expressed his concern to Cashin that the attackers didn't seem to be average people and asked if he was alright. Cashin paused for a moment before revealing that he already knew who was behind the ambush, shocking Duke Sarno. As Duke Sarno tries to ask Cashin how he knew about the ambush, Cashin interrupts him, placing his hand on Duke Sarno's shoulder. He asks the Duke not to worry, giving him a sly smile, and assures him that Anya is precious to him as well and won't cause any trouble. Duke Sarno is taken aback by Cashin's words. In the present moment, Duke Sarno contemplates if leaving Anya with someone like Cashin was a good idea. He sips his tea, worriedly wondering if she might be swept into a grand conspiracy and used as a scapegoat. However, he sighs, realizing that he shouldn't worry too much. After all, Anya is a skilled sword master, and if anything happens, she can defend herself and come back home. He hopes for her to successfully end your married life. A butler arrives and informs Duke Sarno that the Northern Emperor has summoned him. The Duke stands up happily, relieved that he isn't being kicked out of the palace as he had feared. He looks at his guard and contemplates if they should fulfill their task. 
The butler tries to disagree, but Duke Sarno interrupts him, exclaiming that he brought gifts for the emperor, not coming empty-handed. Duke Sarno intends to bribe the emperor and requests that he takes good care of Anya. He also plans to give a stern warning that he won't stand idly if the emperor tries to harm Anya. Meanwhile, the head butler continues to give Anya a boring tour of the mansion. She becomes increasingly irritated and bored. Unbeknownst to the butler, he guides her through a hallway and mentions the locked room that belonged to the late Archduchess, explaining its history and special decorations. Anya has a strong urge to escape from the butler's tedious speech. When the butler asks if she is curious about anything else, Anya immediately interrupts him and firmly states that she has no further questions. The butler then asks if she is now well acquainted with the house's inner structure, to which she hurriedly agrees, wanting to avoid any more of his talking. He takes her to a room and asks her to rest well. Once the butler leaves, Anya lies on the bed and sighs in relief. However, her peace is short-lived as there is a knock on the door. Anya becomes irritated again and sits back up. Craven cheerfully enters her room, and Anya asks him why he is there. He approaches her and tells her that he is there to be by her side. Anya notices that he isn't dressed as a maid. Hearing this, Craven asks if she's disappointed not to see him like that. Anya tells him she's not making Craven smile. Craven then starts to tell Anya about her husband, alerting her. But Craven remarks that with cash and handsome face and high status, it is a wonder why he decided to marry Anya. Anya becomes offended and angry, asking him to shut up. She admits that she also wants to know why Kashin decided to marry her. Their conversation is interrupted by another knock on the door, and both Anya and Craven look at each other in fear when they hear Kashin's voice. Kashin asks if he can come in, and Craven mentally asks Anya if he should hide. Anya shakes her head indicating that hiding would only cause a misunderstanding. She allows Kashin to enter the room. As he comes in, he notices Craven there and tries to ask Anya about him, but she interrupts, telling him that Uncle Sarno delivered a message through Craven. Kashin gives a forced smile, but Anya calmly asks why he has come to her room. Craven trembles with fear as he sees Kashin's cold expression. Kashin informs Anya that he came to let her know about tomorrow's schedule and because he missed her. Anya finds his words corny, but they still make her blush. Just then, Anya's nanny arrives and informs her that her bath is heated. She notices both Craven and Kashin, and asks if she's interrupting something. Anya quickly stands up, relieved by her arrival, and says she will go to wash up. She hurries towards the nanny and tells Kashin that she will go to wash up. Kashin flashes a smile and says to go ahead. As she leaves, Craven bows to Kashin as he announces his departure, and Kashin asks him to stop making Craven flinch. Craven nervously asks Kashin for some time to talk, wondering if his true identity has been discovered. He tries to laugh awkwardly, thinking he can brush it off as he usually does, but seeing Kashin's cold smile, he realizes it won't work this time. As Kashin asks about Craven's true identity, Craven's mouth drops open in shock. Although he had anticipated such an interrogation, he wonders if he made a mistake by claiming to have handled all the ambushers. Kashin reveals that he already has a rough guess about who Craven is, and may even know what he's talking about. Craven awkwardly laughs at Kashin's words. Kashin goes on to say that there are two things he's curious about. Craven's true identity and his relationship with Anya. Craven pauses, considering what to reveal about his relationship with the commander. He finally tells Kashin that they have a close relationship that cannot be easily explained. Craven apologizes to Kashin, explaining that they didn't intend to fool him, but couldn't reveal the truth in advance. He confesses that he was worried about Anya's departure which is why he followed her to the mansion. Kashin listens intently, looking at Craven coldly, causing Craven to gasp in fear. He worries that he may have made his and Anya's relationship sound too romantic. Craven tries to clarify, but Kashin interrupts him and asks if he is a sword master. Caught off guard, Craven becomes speechless. He has no choice but to admit that he is indeed a sword master and asks how Kashin knows this. Kashin proudly explains that only a sword master could defeat all the intruders who ambush the carriage. Craven agrees, acknowledging that his commander is a sword master. Kashin smiles and assumes that Craven must have followed Anya secretly to protect her as her uncle. He extends his hand to welcome him to the Northern Empire. As Craven shakes Kashin's hand, he thanks him, 
but wonders if Cashin has mistaken him for Anir's uncle, Sir Gurhan. Cashin then walks away, telling Craven to enjoy his time in the Northern Empire. Craven is still confused by Cashin's sudden politeness, but says he will. He is thankful that Cashin misunderstood, but wonders if it would be fine to leave it like that. Later, during tea time, Craven tells Anyer about his encounter with Cashin. Anyer asks if he pretended to be her uncle, to which Craven hesitatingly agrees. Anyer places her hand on her throbbing head, frustrated by the situation. Craven protests that he didn't want to leave, but Anyer insists that it would be best for him to go. She remarks that now that she thinks about it, he does look somewhat like her uncle Gurhan. Craven eagerly asks if he really resembles Sir Gurhan to some extent, and Anyer casually replies that he barely does. She sighs, realizing the difficulty of maintaining this charade, especially since her uncle possesses the renowned dragon slayer sword, Lavatine. Anyer swiftly casts magic to open a portal and summons Nevermore, the holy sword that stands opposite. Evermore, born from light and guided to the Hall of Valor. Craven is amazed at the scene as he expected. His commander is at her coolest when wielding her sword. Evermore angrily asks Anyer why she is only calling for them now, and questions if her love for the sword has gone cold. Both Anyer and Craven are left speechless at Nevermore's words. Nevermore continues to complain, reminding Anyer of their promise to cherish them when they sign the contract. Anyer ignores Nevermore's complaints and asks the sword to do her a favor, acknowledging that it's the only thing the sword can do. Nevermore is touched by Anyer's words and praises her for finally realizing their worth. Anyer then points the sword towards Craven, making it turn in his direction. Craven awkwardly laughs at the situation. Anyer then asks Nevermore to pretend to be Lavatine when they meet Cashin. This confuses Nevermore, and it angrily swishes itself left and right refusing to imitate such a lowly and trivial sword. It warns Craven not to lay his hands on its noble body. Craven instantly bows to Nevermore and promises to serve it with all his heart. Seeing him bow, Nevermore is convinced. Craven stands up and vows in a determined tone that he will personally clean Nevermore's radiant blade every morning, afternoon, and evening. His words calm down Nevermore and it asks if he really will do it. Anyer nods and tells Nevermore that Craven is really good at cleaning. This makes Nevermore change its mind, and it allows Craven to make the deal that he will clean it. Craven cries in delight and thanks the prideful Nevermore, while Anyer sighs in relief. It's a good thing that Nevermore is quite easy to handle. The next morning, Anyer arrives to meet Cashin, still not fully accustomed to wearing dresses. Cashin calls for her, making Anyer look at him. He is also dressed well for the occasion and pulls Anyer closer to him, causing her heart to beat faster. He smiles at her and remarks that she is finally looking straight into his eyes, making Anyer blush. She swiftly breaks free from Cashin's hold and asks him to hurry or they will be late. They finally arrive at the Northern Palace. The palace seemed a lot bigger and grander than the Western Empire to Anyer. The castle was filled with many things to look at. Anyer gasps as she sees the sculptures displayed outside. Cashin smiles at her cute expression. The palace's butler arrives and asks Cashin what brought him here. Cashin tells him that he is saying it as if the palace could be visited by him. The butler is startled and says he wouldn't dare say that. Cashin tells the butler that he has come to see the emperor. The butler bows and informs him that the emperor is unwell and that he will have to wait a little longer. Both Cashin and Anyer are taken aback. Meanwhile, inside the northern palace, a man enters a hallway quite rudely. He was angry for some reason. It is the crown prince of the Northern Empire, Edward. He grits his teeth as if he had been scolded by the emperor. The emperor had scolded him for not having any idea what the second prince Mackenzie was up to. He further asks if Edward is even aware of his duties as crown prince and asks him to pull himself together. Edward is now furious as the emperor has treated him like some bothersome, pathetic guy. He kicks a sculpture in rage. The butler tries to calm him down as the emperor will hear of his behavior. Edward glares at him in fury and tells him he doesn't care. As he continues to destroy things, the butler tries to stop him, but to no avail. As Edward tries to kick another sculpture, the butler informs him that his cousin, the Archduke of Terran Eugene, has arrived. 
Edward freezes and asks if his brother has really come. His eyes sparkle and he asks why he's come. After telling him that he's busy, the butler tells Edward that the Archduke was recently married. Edward remembers and remarks that the wedding was only attended by Mackenzie. It's a shame he didn't attend since he was sick at the time. He further calls Cashin a bastard, unaware of his surroundings. Edward asks the butler where he is now. In the meantime, Anura and Cashin were now seated in a room, silent as they drank their tea. Cashin smiles knowingly, as he is fully aware that the Emperor isn't ill. The Emperor of the Western Empire sent Duke Sarno to threaten him with bribes. It must have made him angry. Although the Emperor had sent over his men to ambush on Anur's carriage, they came back alive thanks to an unexpected sword. Master, Cashin knows that the easiest person for the Emperor to take out his anger on would be Edward, which is exactly what happened in reality. Cashin chuckles, causing Anur to look in his direction, and she calls him. Cashin turns to face her and asks what it is. His face had turned serious, confusing Anur, as he had been laughing earlier. She asks him when they will be able to meet the Emperor. Cashin pauses for a moment. It had been four hours since they stepped foot into the palace, and they still hadn't met the Emperor. Cashin smiles at her and tells her that the Emperor is ill. He tells her that there is a beautiful garden in the palace and asks if she would like to take a look around. As Anir steps outside, she stretches herself and yawns. They had been sitting for about four hours, making Anir's muscles ache. She looks around the garden, wondering why the trees are so small. She had come here to rest, but she couldn't find a place to rest. All of a sudden, a man approaches from behind, startling Anira. As a reflex, she reacts swiftly by smacking him. She readies to fight, while the fallen man, Edward, asks if she even knows who he is. He gazes at Anir, at a loss for words, blushing and captivated by her presence. Concerned, Anir inquires about his well-being. Edward quickly reassures her, inquiring if she's an angel. Anir is surprised and wonders if he's crazy. Edward, still entranced, asks for her name. Anir hesitates, reluctant to disclose it. Deciding to avoid him, she sneaks away. Though Edward notices, he ponders whether Anir is feigning ignorance intentionally, curious due to his status as the crown prince. Confidently, he asserts that she likely knows him and expresses his interest in knowing her name. Interrupted by approaching servants, Edward brushes them off, claiming to be busy. He looks for Anir, only to find her gone. Cashin waited for the emperor having finished his tea. Speculating that the Emperor might not meet him today, he considers postponing their meeting due to the upcoming Imperial Party. The door opens, and Cashin briefly wonders if it's Anir, but the butler informs him that the Crown Prince, Edward, is looking for him. Cashin agrees to meet Edward. The butler asks about Anir's whereabouts, and Cashin mentions she's in the garden, offering to relay any message. The butler mentions recent kidnappings of noble ladies and Count Thessalaka's investigation regarding cases. He suggests Cashin's potential assistance. Edward arrives, calling for Cashin, and Cashin informs the butler they'll discuss the matter with Count Thessalak later. Edward approaches Cashin, catching his breath as the butler departs. Cashin inquires about Edward's excitement. Edward enthusiastically reveals finding his dream person, likening her to an angel. Cashin interrupts with a polite cough, and Edward explains he encountered his ideal on the way to meet Cashin, experiencing love at first sight. Cashin grins, prompting Edward to share that the woman disappeared before he could ask for her name leaving him feeling like it was a mirage. He describes her striking features and expresses hope of finding her. Anura enters the room, unbeknownst to her sudden presence. Edward continues describing his dream person with silver hair and red eyes, a unique combination. Cashin's eyes narrow in anger, realizing Edward is describing Anura and leaving him speechless. In the previous installment of this manhwa, Anir's carriage fell under attack on her journey to the capital. She displayed remarkable prowess by defeating all enemies before Cashin's arrival, who surprisingly appeared to save her. However, the credit for rescuing Anir was falsely attributed to Craven, as revealing her true identity was not an option. Subsequently, Cashin approached Craven to express his gratitude, believing him to be both the swordmaster and Anir's uncle. The following day, Anir and Cashin embarked on a visit to the Northern Palace to meet the Emperor. Their request, however, was denied citing the emperor's purported illness. The crown prince Edward, who was unaware of his cousin's wedding, went to greet the couple. On his way, 
he bumped into Anyer. Anyer's captivating beauty instantly captivated him. Edward, in conversation with Cashin, began recounting his encounter with a mesmerizing angel he had seen earlier, unaware that he was describing Cashin's wife. Cashin, growing increasingly infuriated, realized that Edward was unknowingly describing Anyer. The tension escalated when Anyer entered the room, her footsteps resounding on the floor. Edward, curious about the approaching figure, turned to see her. He startled when he saw Anyer, and he eagerly took hold of her hand. Anyer, taken aback, withdrew slightly puzzled by the stranger's actions. Edward warmly reunited with her, declaring her to be the angel he had glimpsed earlier and interpreting their meeting as a twist of fate. Suddenly, Cashin intervened, firmly gripping Anyer by the waist, leaving Edward perplexed and shocked. Cashin, seizing the moment, decided to clarify the situation to the shocked Edward, revealing Anyer as his wife. Edward's disbelief was palpable, and he clung to Anyer, unable to accept that this angelic woman was his cousin brother's spouse. Cashin, with an affectionate smile directed at Anyer, urged her to introduce herself to his younger cousin. Anyer, composed despite the peculiar circumstances, stepped forward and greeted Edward who, scratching his head, reciprocated the greeting. He admitted his defeat and addressed Anyer as his sister-in-law. Cashin, wearing a triumphant grin, observed the confused Anyer, while Edward stood behind them, feeling as though his world was falling apart. Despite their efforts, they were unable to secure an audience with the Emperor. Anyer, exhausted from the day's events, returned to the mansion and sought a moment's delay by lying down in the garden. However, she was roused by loud noises and raised her head to investigate their source. To her surprise, she discovered that the commotion was caused by maids bustling around Craven. The maids, unrestrained in their praise, lauded Craven for his unwavering reliability as the knight who had saved her highness. They showered him with admiration, and Craven enjoys the attention. He introduced himself as the knight entrusted with protecting her highness, and informed the maids that he would be under their care from that point forward, further deepening their admiration for him. A tense atmosphere descends as a young maid named Erica steps forward, her gaze fixed intently on Craven's eyes. Irritation prickles at him as he recognizes her as Erica, the same maid who had been suspiciously watching him, even when he had been disguised as a maid himself. Annoyed and anxious, he quips, asking if there's something amiss on his face, hoping to divert her attention. Erica, undeterred, boldly questions whether they've crossed paths before. Fearful of his true identity being revealed, Craven vehemently denies any prior acquaintance, stating that there's no conceivable way they could have met. But Erica persists, insisting that he feels oddly familiar to her. Attempting to deflect suspicion, he playfully accuses her of using a pickup line, implying her interest in him, all the while hoping his disguise remains intact. Erica remains unyielding, refusing to let the matter go. She's convinced she has seen him somewhere before and tries to recall the specific occasion. Craven's anxiety mounts as he notices the other maids taking notice of their conversation, and he worries that the situation is escalating rapidly. He worries as the situation escalates. Craven changes his tone swiftly, suggesting that they might have encountered each other when they arrived at the Imperial Palace. He elaborates, explaining that since they came together, she must have seen him there. He appears eager to resolve the matter, grateful for coming up with a plausible response on the spot. Erica contemplates his explanation, her curiosity still not entirely satisfied. She still harbors doubt and asks him if that is truly the case. Craven, now growing more nervous, laughs awkwardly, affirming the fabricated story he's concocted. However, as he catches Anyer's angry glare from the garden, his cheerful demeanor fades, replaced by a deep frown. Anyer's aura conveys a clear message. She would be furious if they were exposed due to his actions. Several days pass, and rumors about the imminent imperial party begin to circulate throughout the palace, with only 10 days remaining until the grand event. During their tea time, Cashin inquires about Anyer's preparations for the party. Anyer hesitates in her response, admitting that she had planned to wear whatever she already possessed and hadn't realized the need for extensive preparations. In a sudden outburst, her nanny, who had overheard their conversation, expresses disbelief and angrily questions whether Anyer has learned nothing from her teachings. She emphasizes the dawning nature of high society and warns of the potential mockery by nobles if Anyer appears unprepared. Startled by the nanny's sudden outburst, Anyer instinctively covers her ears, further infuriating the nanny, 
who threatens to contact the Duchess immediately. Cashin intervened, his laughter filling the room as he expressed his delight in finally being able to assist Anya with something. Both Anya and her nanny exchanged confused glances, eager to understand his meaning. Cashin revealed that he had a solution in mind. He had introduced them to a woman named Agatha, commonly known as Martianus Gina, as she informed Anya. Anya was surprised by the Martianus's striking resemblance to her mother in terms of demeanor. Anya greeted her in a simple manner, but the Martianus frowned, deeming such a greeting as typical of Western style. She took it upon herself to instruct Anya in proper northern etiquette, requesting her full compliance with her guidance. Their conversation was suddenly interrupted when Anya's crystal ball displayed an image of her mother, who greeted the Martianus warmly. Anya's mother expressed her honor at having someone of such renown look after her daughter. The Martianus mirrored Anya's mother's sentiments, reciprocating the honor and expressing her delight at meeting both the Duchess and her beautiful daughter. Anya blushed as they continued to compliment her appearance. During their conversation, Anya's mother and the Martianus exchanged pleasantries, promising to meet in person next time. Observing Anya's stiff posture, the Martianus sensed her unease. The Martianus encouraged Anya to relax and began elucidating the intricacies of the royal hierarchy so that Anya could better understand how things worked. Anya discovered that as the Princess of the Western Empire and the Grand Duchess of Terranujan, she would only be required to bow to the Emperor and Empress, exempting all others. The Martianus proceeded to provide Anya with information about the Imperial family of the Northern Empire, emphasizing its importance. She explained that Emperor Gazef had three children from different mothers, two boys and one girl. The late Empress had given birth to Crown Prince Edward, while the second, Prince Mackenzie, was born from a one-night stand with a maid. In contrast, six-year-old Princess Cynthia was born to the current Empress, Empress Pulcheria. The Martianus further revealed that the two princes had a strained relationship, and the nobles were divided on who should inherit the throne. Anya, hearing these details for the first time, was taken aback by the chaotic state of the royal family. She had been completely unaware of this matter. Intrigued by the dispute over the rightful heir, especially when the first prince had already been proclaimed as the crown prince, Anya sought more information. However, the Martianus provided only a brief response, stating that the dispute was ongoing and that she couldn't divulge any further details. Returning to the discussion of the upcoming party, the Martianus inquired about Anya's attire plans. Anya mentioned her intention to wear what she already owned, prompting the Martianus to laugh and comment that it aligned with what Cashin had said earlier. Anya, puzzled by this statement, sought clarification. The Martianus simply informed her that the finest dress was being prepared for her at the capital's largest boutique. A couple of hours later, still fatigued from the etiquette lessons, Anya slumped into a chair. When a knock sounded at the door, Anya assumed it was Craven or Eve and granted permission to enter. To her surprise, it was Cashin who walked in, clearly perplexed by Anya's slouched posture. Anya looked up, her embarrassment apparent upon seeing Cashin. He playfully remarked that she seemed to have had a challenging time. Anya quickly regained her composure, getting up and explaining that it had indeed been a bit tiring her cheeks reddening with embarrassment. She looked at Cashin with anticipation as he called out to her, asking if she could spare some time. As it turned out, Cashin had a surprise in store and needed to take her somewhere. Anya followed behind him as he led the way, holding her hand. Curiosity peaked. She asked about their destination, since he had requested her to close her eyes. Cashin simply instructed her to open her eyes, announcing that they had arrived. As Anya opened her eyes, she was greeted by a breathtaking sight. The night sky was clear, adorned with countless stars and the occasional shooting star streaking across the canvas of darkness. She marveled at the celestial display, her wonder evident. Cashin, with a joyful expression, explained that as a child, he used to come here alone to savor the beauty of this place. Anya was pleasantly surprised by Cashin's choice to bring her to such a serene and picturesque location. She secretly admired this tender side of him, unaware of his appreciation for such moments. Extending her hand towards the sky, she commented on the graceful descent of the stars. Anya then turned her gaze back to Cashin, who found himself captivated by her beauty. 
His heart raced, and he silently acknowledged the beauty that resided within her. Finally, after several days of anticipation, the highly awaited imperial party took place. The ladies in attendance couldn't help but gossip amongst themselves about the extraordinary effort Cashin had invested in finding a dress that perfectly suited the Archduchess surpassing the creations of countless renowned designers. Their conversation hushed as Cashin and Anyer made their grand entrance, announced as the Archduke and Archduchess of Terranugine. Although the couple looked stunning together, it was Anyer who stole the spotlight. The ladies couldn't contain their admiration for her beauty and the elegance of her unique black dress, unlike any shade they had ever seen before, which complemented Cashin's suit. Amidst the attention and admiration, Anyer couldn't help but feel a sense of discomfort and wished to remove the dress. However, respecting the effort that had gone into creating the dress, Anyer decided to persevere despite her discomfort. Cashin, ever perceptive, noticed her knees and offered reassuring words, reminding her that within the confines of these walls, she had no obligation to bow to anyone, as his authority offered her protection. Anyer, appreciating his comforting gesture, expressed her understanding and allowed herself to relax. They continued to walk into the room, and Cashin shared that the Martianess held a special place in his life, almost like a godmother to him. Curious about what Anyer had gleaned from her interactions with the Martianess, Cashin inquired, unaware of the revelations she had uncovered about his dysfunctional family. Realizing that she couldn't divulge that sensitive information, Anyer mentioned that she had learned about proper greetings and the Imperial family. Recognizing that Anyer likely hadn't yet familiarized herself with the various noble families, Cashin nodded and took it upon himself to provide her with a brief overview. He discreetly pointed out noble families they could see and playfully explained which ones were more tolerable than others. Anyer, seeking clarification, interrupted him to confirm that as the Archduchess, she wasn't obligated to maintain good relations with everyone. Cashin nodded and assured her that the decision to forge close relationships or maintain a distance was entirely hers to make. Anyer was pleasantly surprised by his kind and understanding words, while Cashin, silently acknowledging her thoughtfulness, commended her for considering such matters. Anyer couldn't help but feel uncomfortable, realizing that others might grow jealous if they observed Cashin's thoughtfulness toward her. His kindness, though genuine, left her uneasy. Glancing around, she subtly pointed out to Cashin that she didn't see his majesty present at the event. Her initial intentions had not been for her and Cashin to become so closely involved in the affairs of the court. She inwardly cursed the majesty for his disappointing absence. Cashin acknowledged Anyer's observation, admitting that the emperor might indeed not attend. Anyer was puzzled, as she believed they had come specifically to meet him. She expressed her concern that they might be intentionally avoided by the emperor, especially given their previous futile attempts to meet with him. However, their conversation was interrupted as Cashin was called over by Thessalaka, a man he recognized. He hesitated for a moment, torn between leaving Anyer and addressing the urgent matter. Thessalaka informed him of the pressing issue, prompting Cashin to reluctantly depart from Anyer's side. She assured him that she would be fine, and eagerly expressed her intention to assess the situation and decide whom she wanted to be close to or avoid in his absence. Although Cashin was angered by the situation, he clenched his teeth and reluctantly left, promising to return shortly. Meanwhile, in another part of the palace, Crown Prince Edward lounged lazily on a sofa, lost in thoughts about the moment he had first met Anyer. His butler reminded him that the Imperial Party was already underway, but Edward's attention remained fixated on the prospect of seeing Anyer once again. Disregarding any potential reprimand from His Majesty, Edward remained indifferent and continued to yearn for Anyer's presence. He eagerly anticipated seeing her again at the party, recognizing that the chances of encountering her without her husband present were slim. Finally, his butler mentioned that Cashin and Anyer were also attending the party, sparking Edward's excitement. He resolved not to miss the opportunity to greet Lady Anyer, and eagerly approached her, finding her standing alone. He saw this as a perfect chance to strike up a conversation. Anyer greeted him, visibly surprised by his sudden appearance, while Edward was thrilled that she recognized him secretly hopeful about the possibility of mutual feelings between them. Edward informed Anyer that he had something to say, and requested a moment of her time. Anyer agreed, with the condition that it be a brief conversation. Edward, delighted that things seemed to be going his way, led her to the terrace for privacy. As they stepped outside, 
Anya couldn't help but wonder about the purpose of this conversation. Once outside, Edward addressed her by her name, leaving her curious about his choice of addressing her in such a familiar manner. Suddenly, he asked her about her understanding of love, not waiting for her response as he continued explaining that, for him, love was the genuine attraction of the heart. Anya simply remarked, I see, her curiosity peaked as to why he was sharing these thoughts with her. Edward boldly declared that Anya's marital status didn't matter to him, as he was already engaged himself. Before Anya could fully grasp the situation, he confessed his love for her, leaving her utterly shocked. Edward admitted that he had been captivated by her since their first meeting. Anya, in disbelief at his words, quickly reminded him that she was already married. Edward then posed the question of whether it was possible to find true love even after marriage. Stunned by his audacity, Anya asked if he was suggesting they have an affair. Edward confirmed, asserting that their marriages were arranged for political reasons and that love could be pursued through an affair. Anya shook her head in disbelief, contemplating her options. However, she realized she couldn't harm him, considering he was the crown prince. In an attempt to solidify his intentions, Edward took her hand in his and asked if she would be willing to nurture genuine love for him. He suggested that if she didn't desire an affair, she could divorce her husband and marry him instead, while he ended his engagement. Anya couldn't bear this nonsense any longer and snapped as the prince leaned in to kiss her hand. She had not been this irritated since her arrival. Swiftly pointing in the opposite direction, she asked him to look there. Caught off guard, he turned away to see what she was indicating. Seizing the moment, Anya swiftly struck her hand into a specific point on his neck, rendering him unconscious. Anya glared at Edward's fallen body on the floor, contemplating how she had managed to restrain herself from taking more drastic action and marveling at her own patience. She couldn't help but reflect on the situation while Edward lay unconscious. Meanwhile, at the party, Cashin engaged in a conversation with Thessalaka about the recent abductions of ladies in the kingdom. Despite their efforts to hire more guards, the culprit remained elusive, and the victims appeared to be chosen randomly. Thessalaka urged Cashin to address this matter urgently, but Cashin seemed distracted. Sensing his preoccupation, Thessalaka inquired about his focus. Cashin excused himself, promising to discuss it later. With a stern expression, Cashin scanned the room, failing to catch sight of his wife. As he was stopped by another person seeking his attention, he noticed Anya heading to the balcony with Edward. Observing their movements, he wondered about their intentions for going outside alone. He knew Edward had feelings for Anya, but he believed she didn't reciprocate them. Cashin decided to follow them to the balcony, intending to keep an eye on the situation. However, before he could step outside, Anya returned and bumped into him. Curious about her sudden solitude, he inquired where she had been. Anya, ultimately choosing honesty to avoid future problems, told him to listen carefully, setting the stage for an important conversation. Anya revealed to Cashin that his cousin, the crown prince, had confessed his love to her earlier and expressed her concerns about someone like him potentially becoming the emperor, which she believed would endanger the country. Instead of taking the matter seriously, Cashin burst into laughter. Anya was bewildered by his reaction, wondering why he was taking the potential threat to their nation so lightly. Onlookers observed the rare sight of Cashin laughing, as it was an event they had never witnessed before. A while later, Edward's butler finally found him lying unconscious on the ground, unaware of the events that had transpired. The next morning, Anya provided Craven with a detailed briefing on the events of the previous night. Craven was shocked and wondered aloud how the crown prince could have acted so recklessly. He then asked Anya if she had killed him. Anya calmly sipped her tea and stated that she had only knocked him out because he was the crown prince. Craven's shock turned into understanding as he realized that this incident might be the reason behind the rumors he had been hearing about the crown prince feeling unwell. Earlier that morning, a couple of maids gossiped about Sir Craven, recalling how handsome and kind he had been to them. They shared stories of him being a good knight, helping women carry laundry baskets at times, and also marveled at how he had saved the duchess when her carriage had been attacked. As they praised his virtues, Erica, 
One of the maids rolled her eyes in apparent annoyance. Erica remembered observing Craven as well, finding his actions suspicious as he trailed behind Anya, appearing overly friendly. She also noticed his habit of talking to his sword. On one occasion, she had nearly been caught stalking him but managed to take refuge behind a bush, avoiding detection. Deciding to keep a close eye on him due to his suspicious behavior, she followed closely behind him. As Anya and Craven stood discussing the events of the previous night, Erica observed them from her hiding place behind a tree, trying to catch Craven in a shady act to confirm her suspicions. Craven, however, noticed her presence when his sword evermore questioned why she was there again, and suggested that the maid might have developed feelings for him. Engrossed in their conversation, Craven didn't initially notice when Erica approached them and startled him with her sudden arrival. Erica addressed Anya as the Duchess and expressed her desire to speak with her privately. Both Anya and Craven were taken aback by this unexpected encounter, hoping that their cover had not been blown. Anya instructed Craven to leave so they could talk in private. As Craven walked away, he silently hoped that Erica hadn't recognized him from when he had disguised himself as a lady's maid before. The story continues with Erica, the maid, who wanted to talk with Anur in private. Anur asked Erica what she want to talk. Erica told her that she think that Craven is a little suspicious and with a little hesitation. She further says that the guard knight might have feelings for her. Anur is shocked by this statement. Erica reveals that Craven always follows her from behind and he never stays away from her, and was seen talking to his sword like a maniac. She tells him that he's following her to the point she can feel his obsession towards Anur. Anur, with an awkward smile, clarified that she and Craven have known each other for a long time, and there is nothing like that between them. She ensure her that she will pay more attention to this matter from now on, and thanks her as well for her observation and order her to do the same in the future. Meanwhile, in the Imperial Palace, a servant brought a report to the Emperor, and he couldn't believe that all the elites which were sent to kill Anur are all dead. This doesn't make any sense to him. He wonders how could Anur survive the attack. Well, he didn't know that Anur was a swordmaster. He is enraged over Kashin as he refused the marriage that he himself organized for him, and went to Western Empire and got married. He even meet the, the Emperor Cyclian IV face to face who is very clever as he arranged a national marriage between the two empire. And we get to know that Kashin was the in charge of peace and trade in the entirety of Northern Empire, which makes it hard for Emperor to oppose him directly. The Emperor orders his servant to summon the Empress. Meanwhile, the next day, Anur and her nanny were seen going somewhere in a carriage. Three days earlier, Anur received a tea party invitation from the Grand Duchess Marchioness Milasinov. Initially, she tried to decline the offer by stating that it's quite troublesome, but Anur's nanny pressures her to attend, emphasizing the importance of socializing for a noble lady and threatening to inform Anur's mother if she refuses. With no choice remaining, she accepts the offer. In the present, she arrived at the place where tea party was held, and was warmly greeted by the Marchioness Milasinov, who advised Anur to sit, as she has organized the seating arrangement randomly. Anur finds herself seated between two ladies who seem to exchange nervous smirks, signaling potential troublemakers. These two women engage in conversation, attempting to make Anur uncomfortable by discussing things she doesn't know. However, Anur, unfazed, focuses on the cake in front of her and indulges in its delightful taste, oblivious to the attempts of the two scheming women who wanted to unsettle her. Despite the persistent attempts of the two ladies and others to engage in Norin conversation, she remains engrossed in consuming the sweet bakery, much to her delights. But then Anur gets interrupted by a lady. She thinks to herself for a second, and comments on everyone having a good time chatting. The lady in reply, can only laugh, and thinks did Anur possibly finding enjoyment in simply listening to the conversation. After some time, everyone in the tea party were gossiping with the other attendees. Anur came to a realization, that people refrained from conversing with her, assuming she might feel uncomfortable engaging in such discussions. Meanwhile, Kashin, who is seated in his office, 
receives news from a servant about Anur attending the tea party at Marchioness Milasinov's place. Reflecting on a conversation with Anur at an imperial party, where she mentioned the importance of having friends in society as the Grand Duchess of Terenugene, Cashin recalls advising her to do as she pleases, finding it somewhat amusing to see her efforts even with her fragile body. Then someone calls for Cashin's attention through a communication device, a magic ball alerting him that evidence related to a recent attack has disappeared. The person communicating through the magic ball seeks Cashin's decision on whether to continue the investigation or close it. Cashin instructs the individual, Alan, to pursue the investigation further until all relevant information comes to light, to which Alan agrees to proceed as instructed by Cashin. Cashin recollects that Martianus Milasinov holds a significant position in the social hierarchy as an empress consort. He also acknowledges that there is a power struggle between Martianus Gina and Martianus Milasinov. Kashin suspects that Milasinov's actions might be aimed at unsettling Anur, which greatly bothers him. Deciding to intervene, Kashin sets out to fetch Anur on his own. Later that evening, Kashin arrived to fetch Anur and everyone at the tea party was shocked to see Kashin smile. Anur on the other side thinks that Kashin is really handsome and she hopes she could be the only one who can see that smile. But she quickly brushes that thought out of his mind, reminding herself that she will return to the Northern Empire within three months. Kashin observes how challenging the tea party appears, even causing Anur to take a deep breath. Suddenly, Martianus Milasinov came to greet Kashin, who responds her back with a dark expression, making Martianus a little nervous. She then inquires Kashin if he came to fetch Anur, to which Kashin replies in affirmative. He then reveals that his wife is extremely shy and asks her to take care of her in the future. Kashin's unexpected display of friendliness toward Anur shocks everyone, leading to the speculation that perhaps Kashin might truly fall in love with Anur. Anur, visibly affected by the remark, blushes as her cheeks redden in response to the speculation. They both leave the tea party. Kashin, while sitting in carriage, thinks if Anur had been crying as her eye look red, it makes him so annoyed as his heart is always focused on her. He build up the courage and asked Anur how was the tea party. She replied that it was pleasant and the desert was very tasty. Kashin was shocked by her remarks. She further tells him that the ladies are also kind to him. Perplexed, Kashin questions her about finding the lady kind, to which Anur explains that while she was eating dessert, they didn't say a single word to her so that she could eat comfortably, and this time Kashin understand everything what was going on. Realizing that Anur's comment about the ladies being kind was likely a form of sarcasm. As the night falls, Anur lay down on her bed, feeling tired from day's events, but is relieved that she won't be going anywhere for a while, and can rest as much as she wants. But the next morning, Anur Nanny delivers a surprising news that the Empress has sent an invitation this morning. She wants to invite Anur for a lunch today. Anur was shocked as all the plans she made last night were shattered. She suspects, instead of answering with hopes to present at the lunch, Empress purposely prepared a breakfast to make her attend the lunch for sure. The nanny further says that as she and Craven are from the West, they got denied from entering the palace due to security reasons. Anur was shocked with this revelation and find it extremely strange. Arriving at the Imperial Palace with Erika, Anur admires its immense size and feels confident in her gown choice, believing she won't face criticism for her attire. However, Erika, feeling the pressure as lady-in-waiting's representative, is tense and strives to perform better. A maid apologizes to Anur for the delay in the lunch preparation by the Empress, asking her to wait. Suspicious of the delay, Anur wonders if the Empress intentionally or orchestrated this. When Anur asks how long the wait will be, the lady replied, she just have to wait for a while. Anur then decides to wait until the Empress is ready, surprising both Erika and the maid. Erika was angry to think how could the Empress treat Anur, the Grand Duchess of Terra Nugent like this. Anur, while waiting for the Empress, suddenly remembered the time she was on guarding duty. She used to stand for like 12 hours. Meanwhile, Empress was shocked that Anur was standing outside for an hour and a half. She thinks, Anur is doing this to oppose her, which makes her frustrated. And we got to know the plan Empress arranged. She will deliberately treat Anur coldly and let her behave impolitely to herself, and after that she is planning to scold her in front of everyone. Well, all I can say, that plan is pretty mediocre. Anyway, the Empress heard that Anur has a fragile body, so she thinks she won't last long anyway and let her stand. After three hours of standing and waiting with her maid, 
The Empress's maid warns about potential consequences for the Emperor if they continue mistreating Anur, hinting at potential repercussions if Kashin were to find out. Faced with this warning, the Empress reluctantly instructs her maid to bring Anur and her maid inside. Anur, upon entering, greets the Empress. In response, the Empress comments that if she had known Anur would arrive so early, she would have prepared everything beforehand. Uncertain about what to say, Anur simply responds with a brief yes. Then the Empress states that she had prepared lunch in a bright place, and asks her to come with her. Anur shocked to see so many types of dishes and think how can she eat all of this alone. The Empress mentions that she heard Anur went to Malasanov's place to attend a tea party, to which Anur replied in affirmative, and notes that Kashin even came to fetch her. This is the first time he did something like this. He didn't do that even to his former partner. However, Anur remains silent, merely staring at the Empress without offering a response to her comments about Kashin's behavior. Anur, seeking permission, asks the Empress a question. Upon receiving affirmation, the Empress assumes Anur is curious about Kashin's former partner. However, Anur responds by commenting that in the Northern Empire, there seems to be a keen interest in individuals' past romantic stories, whereas in the Western Empire, such inquiries are considered impolite. The Empress was visibly frustrated by this remark. At the same time, Kashin got the news that Empress invited Anur for a lunch and a letter arrived this morning when he went to Count Thessalaka's mansion. Anur Nani raises concern over Anur's delayed return from the Imperial Palace. Kashin, thinking for a second, decided to head to the Imperial Palace at that moment. Meanwhile, at the palace, Anur enjoys the food despite its large portions. The Empress inquires about the taste, to which Anur responds positively. The Empress suggests a walk in the garden, mentioning the beautiful blooming roses at this time of year. Anur agrees, and as they stroll, they come across a resting spot. The Empress gestures for Anur to enter first, and Anur complies, feeling a sense of unease. Suddenly, Anur realizes Erika is not with her. Erika was standing a little distance away. Suddenly, a maid comes toward Erika and order her serve the tea, as she is the Anur lady-in-waiting. She agreed to do so. While she's moving toward Anur and the Empress to serve the tea, one of the maids purposefully tries to make Erika stumble, causing the tea to spill. Just in time, Anur reacts swiftly, coming to Erika's rescue holding her and preventing the tea from spilling, avoiding a potentially embarrassing situation. This unexpected and quick reaction from Anur shocks all the maids present, who question how someone could possess such remarkable speed and reflexes. The Empress, despite being amazed by Anur's speed, decides it's not the time to be impressed and instead, reprimands Anur and Erika for causing a commotion in her presence. She orders both of them to kneel and directs insults at Anur, questioning whether she learned any etiquette during her time in the Western Empire. Tearfully, Erika takes the blame, expressing regret for Anur being in this situation. Meanwhile, Anur maintains a composed and stern expression. While standing, she notices a maid with a deliberately dirty shoe, realizing that the maids intentionally let Erika take their duties, leading to this predicament. Anur then realizes that this entire situation is a trap orchestrated by the Empress. Anur caresses Erika's face, saying it's all right and advises her not to cry. Erika was deeply moved by Anur's words, and she become even more emotional, attributing it's only because of her that she gets humiliated. Anur commands Erika to move, suggesting that the entrance of the Empress's palace is a more appropriate location. Later, we see Anur and Erika kneeling in front of the Imperial Palace. Anur reflects on the situation, realizing she might be able to endure kneeling for about 10 hours. Memories resurface of her past as a knight's apprentice, recalling instances where she would beat up senior members she despised, resulting in reprimands and lengthy kneeling punishments. She once endured 54 hours of kneeling due to her pride. Meanwhile, a maid informs the Empress that Anur has been kneeling for about two hours, sporting a smile on her face. Surprised by this information, the Empress questions the maid regarding the earlier belief that Anur was fragile. The maid remains confident in the information she previously provided about Anur's fragility. Empress looks out of the window and see Anur kneeling and thinks that she's laughing at the current situation. Empress decided to put an end to this. Meanwhile Edward, the crown prince rushes to help Anur. His butler warns him that the emperor will get mad at him, and tries to stop him, saying that he can't go there. But Edward, unfazed, said that his women was in danger, so he has to go. His butler warns him, 
not to say Anor is his women as she's his brother's wife. But the crazy prince pushes the butler and ran away to help Anor. A few days ago, the emperor was seen shouting angrily at the empress, accusing her of discrimination against her stepchildren and expressing concern about the potential downfall of the crown prince. In the present moment, the empress reflects on her actions towards Anur, believing that Anur was the main cause of humiliation for the crown prince. Despite her efforts, she feels everything she did was in vain. Her maid interrupts, warning about potential consequences if the situation escalates further, indicating that the emperor might face trouble. Then a maid arrives with news of the crown prince's arrival, shocking the empress. This unexpected development leaves her surprised and perhaps apprehensive about the unfolding situation involving the crown prince's involvement. Then we see Edward moving towards Anur, seeing her kneel. He experiences a pain in his heart, perceiving it as a pain of love. He crouch in front of her, and utter the worst cliché line to ever exist. Don't cry, my small bird. Anur, after listening to his statement, said she didn't even shed a single tear, and what's with the small bird? Edward, while crying, expresses his intention to Anur that he will talk to the Empress and help her to be forgiven. Cashin arrives, interrupting the scene between Edward and Anur, surprising both of them with his sudden appearance. With a stern expression, Cashin quietly stands in front of Anur, then extends his hand towards her, urging her to take his hand. Anur hesitates, expressing concern that obeying Kashin might anger the Empress since she was ordered to kneel. However, Kashin reassures her that it's not a problem, even if the Empress becomes upset. He crouches in front of Anur, taking her hand and kissing it, declaring that she is more precious to him than anyone else. Just then, a maid arrives and announces that the Empress has permitted the Grand Duchess to return. As they prepare to leave, Anur asks Erika if she can stand up, but Erika, with bruises on her feet, finds it difficult to stand. Kashin acknowledges the challenge of standing after kneeling for an extended period. Concerned about Anur's potential strain, Kashin then hold Anur in her arm and said that he will carry her to the mansion. And for people who might be thinking what happened to Erika, well she also returned safely with the help of other maids. Upon their return to the mansion, Kashin immediately inquires about Anur's condition from the doctor. The doctor informs Kashin that due to kneeling on the floor for an extended period, Anur has cuts on her knees, which are slightly swollen. He advises Kashin that Anur's knees might feel strained and she needs to be careful for some time. The doctor also reveals an ointment which he has given to the maid that can heal Anur's wounds without leaving any scars. Kashin takes the ointment from the doctor, stating his intention to apply it himself. After some time Kashin arrive at Anur's room. Seeing him, Anur asks why is he here, as it should have been Ava to smear the ointment. Kashin asks Anur to show his scars so that he could smear some ointment on it, but Anur said he doesn't have to do it himself. Kashin then crouch and uses her charm skills on Anur, saying, it's alright since she is his wife. Anur feeling losted, thinks that Kashin knows how to put his handsome appearance into good use. She agreed to Kashin's proposal and lifted her gown. Kashin, with an angry expression, saw Anur injuries. He started smearing ointment on her injuries, stating that it will be a little painful. All this makes Anur blushes profusely. And we gets to know how Anur got those injuries. It seems that after returning to the mansion, she hit herself with the tree, causing her those injuries, to make it look somehow real. Curious about her choices, Kashin asks Anur why she accepted the punishment instead of refusing and returning to the mansion. Anur explains that her primary concern was for Kashin, fearing that he might face trouble if she refused the punishment. Realizing the extent to which Anur endured hardships because of him, Kashin blushes deeply and was angry at the same time towards the Empress for doing such things with Anur. Feeling a mix of emotions, Kashin resolves in front of Anur that from the next day onwards, he will make sure that the Imperial family will not treat her so carelessly. This declaration emphasizes Kashin's determination to protect Anur and ensure she is not subjected to such mistreatment again. The story continues with Kashin who was tending to Anur's wounds. Kashin assured Anur of his determination to protect her from any more neglect by the Imperial family. Meanwhile, we see a hoodie guy in the news publication center asking the publisher to publish the paper he brought with him but the publisher refused to publish the news hoodie guy brought as it is too dangerous. The person in the hoodie then offered a bag of gold as a down payment and promised double the amount upon publication. Just then, the hoodie guy opens the door to leave, 
but before leaving he tells the publisher to decide carefully whether he wants to publish the news or not. After he leaves the news center, he then reported all the developments to Cashin, revealing that Cashin was behind orchestrating these events. Cashin, with a menacing smirk, anticipated the inevitable chaos that would unfold the following day. As anticipated, the news spread like wildfire, shocking everyone in the empire. The public was appalled by the revelations about the mistreatment of the Grand Duchess by the Empress. Criticism mounted against the Empress, with people expressing outrage, stating that regardless of Anor's origins in the Western Empire, the severity of the Empress's disciplinary actions was unjustifiably extreme. Meanwhile, the Emperor also read the news and was very angry at the publisher for trying to insult the Imperial family. A butler intervened, urging him to remain composed. The enraged Emperor ordered the butler to halt the spread of the news. The butler pledged to contact the publisher's office to quell the story. In a startling revelation, the butler disclosed the arrival of an official letter from the Western Empire's ruler through the Wizard Tower. He further revealed the content of the letter. The letter conveyed deep remorse for Anor's mistreatment and a stern warning to the Northern Empire against future similar transgressions. Enraged, the Emperor directed his fury towards Kashin, blaming him for the escalating situation he finds himself in. Later, Sitting in the garden, Anor engaged in a heartfelt conversation with her mother through a magical ball. Her mother expressed deep shock upon learning about the harsh treatment Anor endured from the Empress. She disclosed that Anor's father was distraught, unable to cease his tears, and eager to bring Anor back home swiftly. Adding to the gravity of the situation, her mother revealed that the Emperor is also furious, so he sent a warning letter through the Wizard Tower. This revelation stunned Anor leaving her worried as she realized the escalating severity of the problem. Anor's mother asked her about Kashin, and Anor revealed that the publication of that newspaper is the work of Kashin. Anor, with a troubled expression on her face, confessed that she wasn't expecting such an action from him. However, her mother lauded Kashin for his unwavering care and support for Anor. When asked about the events at the Imperial Palace, Anor recounted that out of nowhere, the Empress ordered her to have lunch together. She further tells that the Empress wanted to find Erika's fault so that she could punish her and embarrass Anor in front of everyone. But Anor didn't let that happen, as she knew that Erika will get a death penalty if she hadn't intervened, to which Anor's mother praised her, stating her extraordinary. Meanwhile, we see Kashin, who's at the Imperial Palace, and was warned by the butler that the Emperor is really furious and advises him to not cross the line this time. But Kashin told her that he's not here to meet the Emperor, he has other business inside the palace. Meanwhile, the Empress seethed with fury over the published news, anticipating the Emperor's nagging once more. Just then, a servant arrives, informing her that the Grand Duke of Terran Eugene has come to visit her, she was shocked by his sudden arrival, and ordered the maid to bring him inside. As Kashin entered the Empress's chamber, she greeted him, remarking on the length of time since their last encounter. Kashin reciprocated with a composed greeting. The Empress advised him to have a seat comfortably. Following the Empress's suggestion, he prepared to take a seat, but as he did, his attention was drawn to a photo frame on the table nearby. Curiosity peaked, he picked up the photo to see its contents, realizing it was a picture of Cynthia, the Empress's daughter. With a dark and menacing expression, Cashin grimly remarks that Cynthia is still young, just beginning to read, and it would be unfortunate if she were to become aware of this situation. The Empress, visibly perturbed, tightly grasps his hands, questioning whether he's attempting to threaten her. In response, Cashin sternly warns her of the consequences she might face if she persists in her current actions. Before departing, he leaves her with a final admonition, cautioning her against interfering with those he cherishes in his life. Meanwhile, at the Western Imperial Palace, the Emperor was observed smiling, catching the attention of a man who arrived and stood behind him. This man turned out to be the Emperor's younger brother. Inquiring about the reason for his rare happy mood, the brother was surprised to hear that the Emperor was for the first time worried about potentially losing Anor. Curious, his brother asked him if he had told Anor that her marriage won't last long. The Emperor revealed that it was at the urging of Rosalia, Anor's mother, who insisted with the Emperor to let Anor marry, as she has devoted her youth in safeguarding the Empire. The Emperor then acknowledged that indeed, it's all thanks to Anor's loyal sacrifice, that the Empire has gained its current status, owing much to her devoted service. However, he reassured his brother not to fret 
firmly believing that Anor would eventually return to the Western Empire. Meanwhile, at Kashin's home, his godmother was instructing Anor in some dance steps for the approaching ball. Godmother questioned if the dance steps for ladies were overly simplistic, to which Anor responded in a sarcastic affirmative. Undeterred, the godmother encouraged her to practice the steps anew, starting from the beginning, and envisioning this practice as if it were the actual grand banquet. Just then, Kashin arrives at the scene, he requested his godmother to care for his wife during his absence. Anur, feeling embarrassed, turned her head away, unable to meet his gaze. Kashin called out to her, questioning why she wasn't seeing him off properly. Anur, still shy, softly wished him a safe journey. Unsatisfied with her response, Kashin approached Anur, gently placing his hand on her face and giving her a tender kiss on her forehead. He expressed a hope that next time, Anur might take the initiative in such affectionate gestures. He then mentioned that he would be late, and advised her not to wait up, urging her to sleep beforehand. Kashin Godmother, observing this exchange from behind, comments that they both have a pretty healthy relationship. As night descended, Anur sat by the window, watching the world outside. She couldn't shake off the unease caused by Kashin's prolonged absence. Despite her worries, she tried to reassure herself that everything would be alright. Suddenly, a commotion disrupted the tranquility. Voices rose from below her balcony as a servant urgently relayed news of another servant being attacked by a suspicious individual. The tense scene intensified as Anur, observing the commotion from her balcony, found herself suddenly confronted by an assassin. Swift and menacing, he brandished his sword, causing her to bleed slightly as he directed the weapon towards her. With a chilling demeanor, the assassin inquired if she was the princess of the Western Empire. Meanwhile, at the Silicon Club, Kashin greeted Alan, who had just arrived in the capital. Kashin wasted no time in asking about the report concerning the recent assassin attack on Anor. Alan informed him that the sole witness to the attack had been found dead. Kashin inquires if he has found his body, to which Alan confirmed that they had located the witness's body. He then inquires to Kashin if he should continue investigating the situation, to which Kashin told him to stop the investigation. He states that the reason he's doing this investigation is because he wants to know what exactly Craven did that day. Alan brought forth additional news, capturing Kashin's attention. He disclosed three developments originating from the Western Empire tied to the Knights of the Golden Dragon. Firstly, the disappearance of the sword master, the leader of this esteemed group. Secondly, rumors circulated that the entire division of Golden Knights had initiated a strike, refusing to work without their missing leader. Upon hearing this information, Kashin's expression transformed into a menacing smile, hinting at a calculated plan forming in his mind. This news seemed to trigger an idea where, if executed skillfully, he could potentially acquire his most powerful asset. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Anor, who was being threatened by the assassin. The assassin persistently demanded confirmation of Anor's identity as the princess of the Western Empire. Displaying remarkable reflexes, Anor swiftly countered, delivering a solid kick to the assassin's neck, causing him to stumble and lose his grip on the sword. Seizing the opportunity, Anor adeptly wielded the assassin's sword, pointing it back at him while demanding his identity. Proud of her composed reaction despite the threatening situation, Anor smirked confidently, However, the assassin seemed bewildered by Anor's sudden shift in demeanor. Before she could inquire further, Craven arrived, apologizing for his tardiness and interrupting the tense standoff. Anor then asks Craven if he is the same person that he dealt with last time, to which Craven was not 100% sure. He states that he looks more like a soldier than an assassin. Anor thinks that there's no one in the Eastern Empire that would do something so dumb like this. She suspected the Northern Empire's Empress seeking retribution against Kashin. She then turns to leave the scene and tells Craven that the assassin won't tell anything even if we interrogate him. Craven then asks her then what should we do? Suddenly, the assassin hurled a dagger at her, prompting her to swiftly dodge and adept catch. Reacting decisively, she throws that dagger towards the assassin by answering Craven that there's no other choice but to kill him. The dagger puts a hole in his chest, resulting in his demise. Witnessing Anur's adept skills, Craven praised her swift reflexes. However, their restfulness was brief as Anur sensed a powerful presence. She cautioned Craven just before a formidable figure launched an attack on him with a sword. Craven struggled to discern the assailant's identity, recognizing his formidable strength. 
The man then notices a newer and the dead body of the assassin near her. He was a little shocked, as there's a dead body beside her, yet she didn't even budge. Just then, George, the butler, arrives at the scene and tells both Craven and the man to stop fighting. Once the situation settled, George advised Anora to rest in Cashin's bedroom, ensuring increased guard presence for her safety. Grateful for his efforts, Anora expressed her thanks. As she prepared to leave, she noticed the man kneeling before her. The man introduces himself as Rash Alice, the night guard of Cashin. He expressed remorse for his lack of recognition and his rough conduct in her presence. Despite Anor's reassurances that there was no need for an apology, Rash Alice persistently sought punishment for what he deemed as disrespectful behavior in front of her. Just then, the door opens and a worried Cashin rushed in. He inquired about Anor's well-being, receiving her affirmation that she was unharmed. She disclosed that Craven was the one who saved her from the assassin attack, a confirmation echoed by Craven himself. After a moment moment of contemplation, Cashin made an unexpected request, asking Anor to sleep with him that night. This proposition caught Anor off guard, leaving her visibly taken aback by the suddenness of the statement. Gathering herself, she expressed her surprise at such a proposal, finding the suggestion of sleeping together rather unexpected and nonsensical. However, Cashin, serious in his intent, assured her that he was not joking, and persisted in his request. In a bid to justify his request, Cashin highlighted that it's not unusual for a married couple to share a bed. Despite his explanation, Anor remained unconvinced about the idea of sharing a bed with Cashin. Cashin, seeking reassurance, asked if Anur hated him, to which she responded in the negative. Leaning closer to her, Anur laid out a condition, asking Cashin to promise that he wouldn't touch her without her explicit permission. Agreeing solemnly, Cashin assured her that he wouldn't encroach on her without her consent. He then clarified that assassins were targeting her, and for her safety, he couldn't leave her alone in her room. As the situation dawned on Anur, she realized that by proposing they sleep together, Cashin simply wanted to ensure her protection. As Anur found herself trying to rest in Cashin's room, the discomfort prevented her from finding sleep. After a while, Cashin called out to her, but she chose not to respond, pretending to be asleep. However, her pretense was disrupted when Cashin reached out and gently touched her hair, startling her. Reacting sharply, Anur turned to face Cashin, warning him that she'd kill him if he continued to touch her without permission. Cashin, unperturbed, expressed his willingness to face death if it were at Anur's hand. Sensing her restlessness, he inquired whether her inability to sleep was because of him, to which Anur remained silent. Despite her silence, Cashin understood that her discomfort was indeed caused by his presence. Cashin, sensing Anur's discomfort, decided to distance himself from the bed. Anur inquired where he was heading, to which Cashin told her that she couldn't sleep because of him, so he's going to work so that she could sleep comfortably. After some time, Cashin immersed himself in his work, whereas Anur remained unable to find sleep. Eventually, Anur rose from the bed and requested Cashin not to disclose the day's events to her mother. She emphasized her mother's deep concern for her well-being and feared that learning about the attack would greatly distress her. Cashin agreed to keep the incident confidential, understanding Anur's worries about her mother's anxiety. Anur's attempt to sleep was clouded by thoughts of an impending divorce from Cashin in three months' time. This prospect led her to ponder the fate of Cashin post-divorce whether he would move on and marry someone else. The uncertainty surrounding these thoughts stirred a profound and inexplicable ache within her heart, leaving her emotionally unsettled. Just then, Cashin moves towards her and calls her for her attention. He asks her what she was so worried about, to the point she didn't realize he was coming. Why did she look so anxious? He asked. Anur then confronted him, questioning why he had married her. Cashin remained silent opting to gently touch her face and draw closer to her. Anur, on the other hand, made him remember his promise that he won't touch her without her permission. But Cashin, without hesitation, leaned towards her and kissed her. Anur, unable to resist her temptation, couldn't stop Cashin. She questions herself why the kiss is so sweet and why her mind is going blank. After this affectionate gesture, Cashin placed a tender kiss on her forehead, advising her to sleep. Frustrated and angry, Anur glared at Cashin, but he seemed unfazed by her reaction, unperturbed by her anger. The next day, Anur seemed a little tired, as she didn't sleep all night yesterday. She reflected that while she was determined to resist any physical contact from Cashin even the slightest touch, 
she found herself utterly defenseless against his kisses. This inner conflict left her feeling drained and puzzled. In this state of inner turmoil, Craven noticed something amiss and inquired about her well-being. Reacting impulsively, Anor grabbed Craven's collar, drawing him closer, but realized she felt nothing when their faces were near. This realization caused her to abruptly push Craven away from her, adding to her confusion and distress over her complex feelings. Just then, Cashin arrives at the scene, and introduces Rashalis to her. Rashalis politely greets him, and he once again apologizes for the last night's rudeness. Anur tells him that to forget it, as the last night was an unforeseen circumstances. Cashin, concerned, inquired if Anur was okay with what happened the night before. Referring to the assassin attack, she admitted feeling startled, but conveyed that she was fine now. Expressing his gratitude, Cashin thanked Craven for safeguarding Anor the previous night and requested his continued protection. Craven readily agreed to fulfill this request. However, Anor, embarrassed by the misunderstanding, realized Cashin was referring to the protection from the assassin, not their kiss, adding to her discomfort in the situation. Cashin then revealed that the dead body of the assassin disappeared without a trace. The room where the assassin was left at is said to have a magical energy that cannot be sensed. He tells her that he won't let a bad thing like this happen again, and further reveals that he will entrust Rashalis as her escort, stunning her with this unexpected arrangement. In an attempt to dissuade Cashin, Anor expressed concerns for his safety as well. Craven intervened, reassuring Cashin that he would take responsibility for Anur's safety. Cashin, acknowledging Craven's confidence as a seasoned sword master, agreed to Craven's proposition, indicating his acceptance of Craven as Anur's guardian. Cashin then reveals that he will be busier in the future, so he will leave the mansion even more often. He then introduces Alan to her, stating that he will assist her during the time he is not around. Alan respectfully greeted Anur, introducing himself, and she reciprocated the greeting. While bowing, Alan pondered Cashin's request for him to look after Anur despite knowing his busy schedule. He couldn't help but notice Cashin's intense and threatening glare fixed upon him, causing him to feel a sense of unease. As Cashin turns to leave, he bids Anur to enjoy her tea time before departing from her and Craven's vicinity. Moving a short distance away, he ordered Rashalis to take over his duties from that point forward. Rashalis acknowledged Cashin's directive with an affirmative response, signifying his acceptance of the new responsibility assigned to him. In the Imperial Palace, the Emperor was furious at his knights as they failed to kill the Anur. Emperor orders the knight to kill Anur as soon as possible. Just then, a butler arrives and reveals that the security of the Terran Eugene mansion increased by three times. The Emperor was in a fit of anger after hearing the news. He thinks that he has no choice but to leave the matter. Butler intervenes and tells the Emperor that it's not over yet. The Emperor asks him if he had a plane, to which the butler approaches the Emperor and whispers something in his ear. After hearing the butler's plan, the Emperor smiles and thinks there's still a way to kill Anur after all. The scene shifts to a few days ago at Terran Eugene Mansion, where Cashin was ordering Rashalis to protect Anur when he was not around. In the present time, Rashalis was discreetly following and observing Anur, who was peacefully savoring her tea in the garden, while accompanied by Craven. Just then, Craven looks at Rashalis, but couldn't find anyone. Rashalis thinks that he almost got caught. Suddenly he notices a servant approaching Anur, and he is shocked after seeing him. Meanwhile, Alex informs Cashin that a party invitation had arrived from the Imperial Palace. As Cashin took the letter from Alex, he thinks it's most likely a trap. Alex, concerned about the potential risks, inquired about Cashin's decision regarding the invitation. However, Cashin was uncertain about his course of action, admitting his lack of a definitive plan. Expressing his apprehension, Alex advised Cashin to skip the party, likening the situation to a dawning endeavor, akin to entering a dragon's den to capture the beast itself. Just as they deliberated over this concern, Rashalis made an entrance into the room. Cashin inquired if he had a report. In response to Cashin's inquiry, Rashalis relays the recent incident. A disguised assassin infiltrated the mansion at noon, posing as a servant. He explains that Craven was the one who effectively managed the situation, handling the threat skillfully. Alex expressed his admiration for Craven's courageous response. Rashalis further tells Cashin that Craven was talented with sword, but the sword he owns is not normal, which piqued Cashin's interest. 
Rash Alice continued, revealing in astonishing detail he had observed Craven engaged in a conversation with his sword. This unusual interaction led Rash Alice to speculate that the sword in question might possibly be Levitine, also known as the Dragon Sword. Levitine is a legendary sword renowned for its incredible power. It is said to have slain a dragon, thereby absorbing its strength and acquiring remarkable abilities. The sword previously owned by a revered sword master is considered a highly coveted and revered artifact due to its extraordinary prowess and the legend surrounding it. Cashin thinks that everything that has happened in the past points to Craven being a sword master, but still he feels a little bit of doubt. Just then Rash Alice calls Cashin, and Cashin inquires if he has some other reports. Rash Alice shares his gut feeling about Anur, expressing that there's something peculiar about her demeanor. Cashin inquires what he means. Rash Alice highlights that during both encounters with the assassin, Anur remained remarkably composed and unfazed, despite the potential danger in the presence of a deceased individual nearby. Rash Alice questioned how she could stay calm when her life was in danger. She wasn't scared of the corpse at all, which is very different from other ladies. Cashin falls silent, considering Rash Alice's observations about Anur's behavior. Meanwhile, Godmother was teaching dance steps to Anur. In the midst of the dance lesson, Anur notices Cashin on the building opposite. Cashin greeted Anur and she reciprocated the greetings. Witnessing the scene, the godmother tells Anur that it's good that the two of them are getting along. She then mentions that she heard about Anur's challenging experiences at the Imperial Palace, but is pleased to see her in a better state now. Anur responds with a slightly awkward laugh. Godmother acknowledges that she heard about Anur's delicate health condition, stating that she must have a strong mental resilience. Anur responds, affirming that she tends to be that way. Godmother mentions that when Kashin was young, he seemed mature beyond his years. She expresses delight that Kashin has such a wonderful partner like Anur, emphasizing that the position of Grand Duchess of Terran Eugene is exceptionally significant, not something everyone is deserving of. Anur appears confused not fully comprehending the significance of Godmother's words. Godmother unveils that Cashin lost both of his parents at a young age, leaving him devoid of any familial affection. Her time caring for Cashin was extremely brief. He grew up almost as if confined within the Terran Eugene castle, leading a solitary existence. As he matured, people began to gather around him. But no one has truly seen Cashin's genuine self yet. Godmother suggests that those who got close to Cashin either had ulterior political motives or were seeking the wealth associated with the Terran Eugene name. She notes that apart from Anur, no one has brought him as much happiness. Godmother then bows down and requests Anur to watch over Cashin. Anur appears a little surprised or taken aback after hearing Godmother's statement. Later in the evening, Anur appears to be having a conversation with her mother. Anur's mother asks her what's wrong, as it seems to be the first time Anur has initiated the conversation. Anur seems troubled and thinks in her head that she was planning to get a divorce into months, but she was asked to watch over her husband Kashin. Anur's mother inquired again what's wrong, as Anur seems troubled. Anur then asks her mother if she can really get a divorce. Her mother asks her why she suddenly asked that. Anur, feeling apprehensive, explained that she was worried her mother might scold her and arrange a marriage with someone else. The Duchess expressed her concern, mentioning her worry about Anur feeling lonely due to her previous decision to decline marriage. In response, Anur reassured her, stating that she hadn't felt lonely despite not getting married. However, the Duchess countered, expressing her belief that although Anur might not feel lonely now, in the future, when everyone dies, her life as a swordmaster with a longer lifespan would potentially lead to feelings of loneliness. The Duchess inquired if Anur now comprehends her mother's emotions. Anur responded, suggesting that the mother worries excessively. In turn, the Duchess acknowledged that relying solely on strength to live in this world isn't sustainable, and tells her to pursue whatever her heart truly desires. With a hint of hesitation, Anur asked her mother if she could immediately seek a divorce and return to the Empire. Her mother reacted with anger, loudly insisting that Anur must fulfill her promise. The Duchess, feeling fatigued, mentioned her need for rest and suggested that Anur should call her again after some time. After Duchess disconnects the magic ball, Anur contemplates if she stays here any longer, Kashin will make her change her mind. Just then, Kashin appeared at the scene and called out to Anur, seeking her attention. Kashin informed Anur about the upcoming Imperial Palace banquet schedule for the following day. Anur, on the other hand, thinks that Kashin's presence is as calm as the moonlight. 
she drew closer and embraced him, discerning the rhythm of his heartbeat. In that moment, memories surfaced of what her godmother had mentioned about Cashin. She thinks he grew up in that kind of environment. That's why he's used to erasing his presence. Cashin playfully asked Anur if she was so captivated by his face that she couldn't take her eyes off him. Anur replied affirmatively, expressing her admiration by mentioning his striking handsomeness. Cashin blushed and smiled upon hearing her compliment, teasingly remarking that he has to take extra care of his face since Anur likes it. The next day, Anur and Cashin arrived at the Northern Imperial Palace. Cashin extended his hand to assist Anur in carefully disembarking from the carriage. While doing so, he mentioned to Anur that the banquet scheduled for that day might turn out to be a bit noisy. Curious, Anur inquired about the reason, but Cashin responded with a smile, leaving her questioning his enigmatic expression. Inside the bustling banquet hall, Count Thessalaka was observed searching for Cashin, intending to convey crucial information to him. Upon spotting Cashin, the Count made his way towards him. However, Cashin preempted the conversation, suggesting that they discuss matters later at the mansion. Count Thessalaka persisted, urging Cashin to listen, as the information held significant importance. Cashin glanced tensely at Anur, but before he could take action, Craven intervened, assuring Cashin that he would protect Anur. Craven advised Cashin to proceed without worry. Cashin, in response, instructed Anur to wait briefly, assuring her of his imminent return. As Cashin started to leave, Edward spotted him from behind. Edward's face twisted into a maniacal smile upon seeing Anur standing alone. Sensing someone's gaze, Anur turned her head and noticed Edward standing on the stairs, waving at her. Observing Edward's smile, Craven, puzzled, wondered who had caught Edward's attention. He then asked Anur if the person waving was the crown prince who had made an absurd remark earlier, to which Anur confirmed with a yes. As Anur decided to depart, she pondered her expectations, realizing she hadn't even caught a glimpse of the emperor yet, and the empress hadn't made an appearance either. In her thoughts, she questioned whether the Empress might have been restricted from attending due to the events of the previous night. She then notices Cashin conversing with the Count of Thessalaka. Craven inquires what happened, as the atmosphere feels different than usual. Anur reveals that there is something that was bothering her. Craven inquires what. Anur tells Craven that she wants to know something about someone. Craven suggested that if she genuinely wanted to know, she should easily be able to find out. Anur responds by telling him that she doesn't want to because it'll bother her as soon as she finds out. And what's bothering her the most right now is Cashin. Anur didn't know much about Cashin. She is not confident enough as well. She tells herself not to cross the line, even if they were to get a divorce one day, they still have to be polite and respect each other. Anur, feeling hesitant, told Craven to disregard her previous statement. However, Craven, wearing a peculiar expression, questioned if she truly was his captain, suggesting her words seemed out of character. Anur tells him that she's serious right now, but Craven interrupted, inquiring if she had developed feelings for Cashin, catching her off guard and causing her to become flustered. As Craven and Anur were chatting, Prince Edward saw them from behind. He angrily curses at Craven for sticking with Anur. He thinks he must eliminate him this instant. However, as he moves closer to Anur, he spots Butler engaged in a suspicious conversation with a servant nearby. Edward, sensing something amiss, decides to eavesdrop on their conversation to gather more information. Butler confides in the servant about a plan to separate the red-haired knight from Anur's side. Edward, overhearing their conversation, assumes they're referring to Craven. Butler then questions who would be suitable for this task. At that moment, Edward steps out from his hiding spot, interrupting them, and declares that he will personally eliminate Craven himself. Later, Edward approached Anor and Craven, and Craven respectfully bowed to greet him. Edward informed Craven that something had occurred, stating that the supervisor wished to meet with him. Craven appeared hesitant, reluctant to leave Anor alone. However, Anor encouraged him to go, assuring him that she would be fine. Craven, perceiving Edward's intentions to be quite transparent to have him leave so he could be alone with Anur, but he won't let it go his way. He apologized to Edward, claiming ignorance about the supervisor's whereabouts, and requested Edward to guide him instead. 
Edward questioned why he should be the one to do so. In response, Craven pointed out that Edward was the one who had informed him about the supervisor. Initially, Edward, visibly irritated, glared at Craven, but eventually, Craven took him along to locate the supervisor. Alone in the midst of the bustling banquet hall, Anor observed Cashin engrossed in his own affairs. She wonders that she didn't feel this way when she was alone at the banquet hall the last time. She questions herself. Why did she keep feeling lonely like this lately? Just then, a lady approached Anur and stood behind her, inquiring if she was the Grand Duchess. Anur, curious, asked about the lady's identity. The lady introduced herself as the daughter of Count Frisian, expressing her long-standing desire to engage in a conversation with Anur. The lady called a waiter, suggesting that they have a drink to commemorate their encounter. She then inquired if Anur hailed from the Western Empire and Anur confirmed this. The lady intrigued, asked if they truly consumed apples covered in gold. There, Anur clarified, denying the presence of gold-covered apples and explaining that they referred to yellow apples as golden apples. The lady began sipping her wine, but Anur hesitated. Observing Anur's reluctance, the lady encouraged her to give it a try, assuring her of its good taste. Anur decided to take a sip, and as she did, the lady's expression abruptly shifted to a serious demeanor. As Anur consumed the wine, she began to feel dizzy, as she was about to fall, the waiter caught her from behind. Unbeknownst to Anur, the sinister plan unfolded firstly, separating Craven from her side, followed by making her intoxicated, and ultimately orchestrating her kidnapping when no one was vigilant. While Craven moved with Edward to meet the supposed supervisor, he couldn't help but worry about Anur's well-being. However, before he could express his concerns, Edward interrupted, instructing Craven to proceed into the room. Edward mentioned that he would be heading back, and Craven, though thankful, remained anxious about Anur's safety. As Craven entered the room to call the supposed supervisor, a sudden attack by an assassin caught him off guard. Reacting with agility, Craven skillfully dodged the assailant's strike and counteracted by delivering a swift knee kick, rendering the assassin unconscious. In the aftermath, Craven inquired of the supervisor if they happened to know the assailant, but the supervisor hastily fled from the scene without providing any answers. Searching the unconscious assassin's body revealed no clues about his identity. Puzzled, Craven wondered why he had been targeted. Quickly realizing it was part of a scheme to separate him from Anur, he hurriedly made his way back to the banquet hall. However, upon reaching the hall, he couldn't find Anur anywhere. Meanwhile, the emperor issued a command to his butler, instructing him to prevent the empress from attending the party, to which the butler agreed. Inquiring about any updates on Anur's kidnapping, the emperor was interrupted by a waiter who barged into the room. The waiter gleefully informed the emperor of the successful poisoning of Anur, prompting a laugh from the emperor as he realized the simplicity of the matter. The waiter revealed that they had secured Anur and relocated her to another place, questioning if they should kill her now. However, the emperor opted to spare her for the time being, considering her potential usefulness. With a sinister plan in mind, the emperor decided it was time to head to the Grand Hall and relish the reaction on Cashin's face. Meanwhile, Cashin wonders what Anur's gaze earlier was about. Ever since they entered the Grand Hall, Edward has been watching Anur. Sure enough, when he left her side, he would have approached her. Cashin wonders why he felt so uneasy. Even though he knew there was a swordmaster accompanying her, when Anur and his eyes met, she quickly averted her gaze, as if wanting to escape. Cashin found himself unable to understand the intricacies of the situation. Cashin thinks she might have some problem going on, or maybe it's because of the previous night. He questions whether his actions were too hasty and wonders why his heart is filled with agitation making it difficult for him to find calmness. Just then, a servant arrives and tells Cashin that Anur was nowhere to be found. Cashin was shocked after hearing this. Concerned, he inquires about Craven, who was supposed to be escorting Anur. Meanwhile, the Emperor made his grand appearance inside the banquet hall. The Emperor thanked everyone for coming and making the banquet even more interesting. The Emperor notices Cashin and greets him, remarking on the passage of time. Cashin reciprocates the greeting. The Emperor inquires about his wife, mentioning the efforts he went through to authorize their marriage. Cashin smiles, ready to respond, but is interrupted as Anur arrives, apologizing for being late. Both Cashin and the Emperor are surprised by her sudden appearance, creating a moment of shock and curiosity. Andy minutes earlier, Anur hesitated when offered the wine, noticing that the red wine didn't carry the usual sour scent. Suspicion arose 
and she pondered whether it might be poison. Despite her uncertainty, Anor decided to drink the wine, likening the situation to capturing a dragon believing that to capture it, one must enter its cave. As Anor consumed the wine, dizziness overcame her, and the lady discreetly guided the waiter carrying her. The waiter, perplexed by the rapid onset of the effect, considering Anur had only taken a small sip, questioned why it worked so quickly. The lady casually responded, stating that the impact varies from person to person. As two assassins entered the room, they instructed the waiter to leave Anur in their care, and he complied. While the assassins began to take Anur away, the lady informed the waiter that she would be leaving. Once placed in a chair, one of the assassins questioned if Anur was dead. To their surprise, Anur suddenly opened her eyes and swiftly punched one of the assassins on the head, rendering him unconscious. The second assassin unsheathed his sword, warning Anur not to come closer. Undeterred, Anur questioned who ordered him to poison her drink. The assassin, scoffing at the idea of revealing any information, asked if she seriously believed he would talk. Anur, laughing sarcastically, asserted that she would see if he could maintain his silence after she started breaking his bones. The assassin then begins to attack Anur, and Anur dodges all the attacks swiftly. She then counters with a heavy strike on his neck rendering him completely defeated. Standing over the fallen assailant, Anur pressed the question again, demanding to know who had ordered the poisoning. Reluctantly, the defeated assassin revealed that the order had come from the emperor himself. Anur was shocked after finding out that the northern emperor was the one who ordered her assassination. She thinks it's not the first assassination attempt. It happened a few times in the past. In the midst of the revelation, Anur pondered the emperor's motives for ordering her assassination. The assassin, attempting to protect the emperor, claimed sole responsibility for the plot, insisting the emperor's innocence. However, Anur, understanding the intricacies of the situation, assured the assassin that there was no need to cover for the emperor. Acknowledging the emperor's position and the assassin's concerns for his family, she declared her intent to deal with the emperor herself, vowing to kill him first. Drawing her sword, nevermore, Anur swiftly ended the assassin's life. In the present, Anur greeted the emperor who, puzzled by her sudden appearance, reciprocated her greeting. Anur expressed gratitude for the emperor's welcome, yet in her thoughts, she contemplated the reasons behind the emperor's attempt on her life. She pondered whether there was a personal grudge or if the emperor harbored intentions to instigate a war with the Western Empire. Anur thinks maybe it's because the emperor knows that she's a swordmaster. She understood that eliminating her might be a strategic move to weaken the strength of the Western Empire. The emperor, consumed by rage upon learning that Anur had supposedly been poisoned, was baffled by her apparent well-being. Kashin, witnessing the emperor's frustration, smiled and thanked him for the congratulatory message on their marriage. Unable to contain his anger, the emperor turned to leave the banquet, advising Kashin to remember that his marriage symbolized harmony between the Western and Northern empires, and to live happily. Amidst the lingering tension, other nobles extended their congratulations to the couple. The acknowledgement from the emperor, who had authorized their marriage, solidified Kashin and Anur's status as the Grand Duke and Grand Duchess of the Empire. After the Emperor departed the banquet hall, Anur called Kashin over, leaving him puzzled about how she managed to escape the Emperor's plan. Kashin, unsure of her intentions, inquired about what she wanted. Anur, in turn, questioned if she did well, leaving Kashin bewildered. As he grappled with his feelings, Kashin couldn't shake the sense that Anur seemed different, prompting her to ask why he was looking at her that way. Kashin, lost in thought, couldn't shake the feeling that the Anor before him was somehow changed from the one he knew. As Anor moved to look for Craven, Kashin halted her by holding her hand. Anor inquired about his intentions, Kashin hesitated, wanted to say something, but decided not to. The next day at the Terran Eugene mansion, Kashin questioned Alex about Craven's presence at the party. Alex disclosed Craven's account, stating that he went with the crown prince to meet the supervisor, but was attacked by an assassin. Despite the assault, Craven successfully defeated the assailant. Kashin, contemplating the events, pondered whether Anur had single-handedly resolved the emperor's plot. Intrigued, he questioned the details of how exactly she managed to accomplish this feat. As Kashin moved towards the window, he discovered Anur sitting with Craven, both enjoying their tea. Kashin stared at her intently, his thoughts immersed in the recent events. Meanwhile, Craven was shocked to learn that the Emperor had given the order to assassinate Anur. Anur advises Craven to be quiet, 
Craven asks Anor if the person who's trying to kill her all this time was Emperor, to which Anor responds by saying most probably. Anor urged Craven to keep the information about the Emperor's involvement a secret, emphasizing the lack of concrete evidence. Craven agreed to maintain silence, intrigued. He questioned Anor about the motive behind the Emperor's attempts on her life. But Anor admitted that she too was unaware. Craven pressed further, asking if Anor had killed the people who ambushed her. Anor negated, revealing that she had spared them but marked them with a cursed symbol. Craven inquires about the mark. In response to Craven's curiosity about the mark, Anor explained that it was a type of cursed emblem that inflicted unbearable pain if the individuals attempted to reveal any secrets. Anor inquires to Craven what is he doing when she was kidnapped. Craven explained that he had gone to meet the supervisor, but encountered a suspicious individual who attempted to incapacitate him. Despite the challenge, Craven managed to handle the situation and thwart the assailant's efforts. Anor expressed her concern to Craven, mentioning that she thought he was captured since he didn't show up for a considerable time. Craven assured her that he had a valid reason for the delay. However, in his thoughts, he contemplated whether he should reveal to Anor that he had seen a specific individual at the banquet. During the banquet, Craven couldn't be certain since it was just a glimpse, but he believed the person he saw was a fellow Golden Dragon Knight named Urzan. Attempting to confirm his theory, Craven followed him, but amidst the crowded venue, he eventually lost sight of Urzan, leaving the confirmation hanging in uncertainty. Craven further thinks that it's best to tell Anor about Urzan. As he tries to reveal what he saw yesterday to Anur, he found himself interrupted as Anur's maid, Ava, arrived on the scene. She informs Anur that a lot of invitation have arrived for her. Anur inquires about the invitation and the maid reveals that the rumor about what happened during the party in the Imperial Palace has spread, so many nobles have sent invitations to her. As Anur asked Craven if he was saying something, he assured her that he would tell her next time. Anur then moved on with her maid. Upon seeing the multitude of invitations, she was shocked. Godmother explained that all the invitations were for her. The other maids chimed in, stating that they would carefully select events suitable for someone of her stature, emphasizing the importance of sending the Grand Duchess to appropriate occasions. The Godmother suggested the idea of Anor holding a tea party herself. Inquiring about Anor's experience in hosting such events, to which she replied in the negative, the godmother proposed starting with a light tea party. The godmother emphasized that the tea party would be a perfect occasion to introduce Anur to influential individuals and potentially make new friends. Anur expressed happiness at the idea of having friends, explaining that her upbringing as a swordswoman from a young age had left her without peers her own age. Excited by the prospect, Anur agreed that hosting a tea party sounded great. The godmother suggested holding the tea party in a western style, but Anur, unfamiliar with the concept, didn't grasp the idea. Godmother explained that the Northern Empire's nobles secretly appreciated the culture and atmosphere of the Western Empire. She believed hosting the tea party in a Western style would be the best approach. The godmother expressed her desire to introduce a merchant to Anur, highlighting that the merchant was currently the most preferred among the nobles and known for expertly handling goods from the Western Empire. Godmother asked if it would be acceptable to introduce this merchant to Anur, to which Anur agreed. As the maid informed the godmother that the elusive shop owner, the merchant in question, had arrived, godmother instructed the maid to let him in. Upon entering the room, the merchant greeted Anur. And we get to know that the merchant was none other than Urzan, the member of Anur Golden Knight. He introduces himself as the owner of the Western Gold Merchant Guild, leaving Anur completely shocked and questioning the reason for his unexpected presence. The revelation added a surprising twist to the unfolding scenario. The Manwa continues with Urzan introducing himself to Anur, and Anur was shocked after seeing him and wonders why he's here. The godmother tells Anur that Urzan has the title of Viscount in the Western Empire. She thinks that Urzan received that title after the end of the Eastern Kingdom Alliance War. She wonders if the entire Knight Order has come to the Northern Empire, just like Craven did. Urzan then introduces his Western Empire-style products, especially used for tea parties. It's a tea set made by a famous craftsman in the Western Empire. He further states that the pattern of these tea sets is said to have crushed emeralds incorporated into it. The godmother also praises the tea sets, deeming them luxurious and beautiful. 
to which Erzin agrees, mentioning that they are rare to find even in the Western Empire. The godmother then asks Anur about buying the sets as a gift for the Grand Duke, and Anur was shocked by the sudden question. Witnessing Anur's puzzled expression, the godmother tells Anur to tell her if she feels shy. Anur responds to the godmother by stating that she is not shy. In her mind, she thinks it's because one of her subordinates suddenly showed up after switching jobs to a merchant. Anur's nanny intervenes and tells the godmother that Anur seems to be tired since she didn't sleep well last night. The godmother apologizes to Anur for holding her for so long and informs Anur that she'll be leaving now, advising her to rest. Once alone in the room, Erzin tells Anur that he will be leaving as well. Anur responds by telling him that she wants to meet him later, as she has something to talk about separately. Erzin, with a smile on his face, agrees to meet Anur. After some time, Anur, accompanied by Craven, meets Erzin. Excited to see him, Craven asks if he also came to serve Anur. Anur, troubled by the current situation, sighs as she realizes that two out of three Golden Knight specialists left their post and came to the Northern Empire. She thinks that the three Golden Knight specialists serve directly under the Emperor. Craven is the deputy commander, Erzin is the diplomat, and she doesn't want to think about the third one. She fears that if she mentions him, he might actually come here like those two fools. Anur then questions Erzin why is he here? To which Erzin, with a funny pose, replied to her by telling her that it's her father's lifelong dream. He further told her that her father is the owner of the massive merchant organization connecting the Northern Empire and the Western Empire. He continues that her father always wants him to be a merchant, and when he said that he will fulfill his dream, Erzin's father gave him the whole branch of the Northern Empire Merchant Organization. Anur tells Erzin that she knew he didn't come to the Northern Empire because of a sudden urge of filial piety. She further told him to get straight to the main point. Erzin told her that he's in the Northern Empire because of her, not some sudden urge of filial piety. Anur, taken aback, questions why he didn't approach her directly if his presence was tied to her. Erzin responds with sarcasm implying he's not as reckless as a certain deputy commander who would rush to her without considering the potential fallout. Erzin explains to Anur that he strategically chose to be at the palace, knowing she would eventually have to come there. He anticipated they could cross paths when she came to obtain her marriage certificate from the king, considering she was already married. Anur's head begins to ache from Erzin's words. Meanwhile, Craven interjects, mentioning he may have seen Erzin in the palace before, but wasn't certain. Erzin told Craven that he was amazed at his stupidity, remarks on Craven's apparent lack of recognition, noting they even made eye contact during their previous encounter. Anur questions Craven why he didn't mention seeing Erzin at the banquet. Craven admits he tried to tell her but missed the right moment. Anur then turns to Erzin, acknowledging his wait for her but demanding clarity about his merchant claims. She urges him not to hide behind excuses of filial piety, and insists on hearing the truth. Erzin approaches Anur, suggesting that establishing a foothold in the capital would be beneficial for her. Curious, Anur asks him what kind of assistance he could provide. With confidence, Erzin asserts that the social circle operates like a battlefield of information, and he could excel in that domain, especially since Anur might be lacking in that area. Anur is left questioning her own capabilities, wondering if she truly is weak in this aspect. Anur confronts Erzin, questioning his motives for his actions. Erzin confesses that he's doing it to ensure Anur can't leave him. Puzzled, Anur wonders what she should do, realizing it's increasingly difficult to tell Erzin about her impending divorce into months. She then inquires if all the Golden Dragon Knights have resigned from their positions. Erzin confirms they have, but explains that the Empire is holding them back to prevent potential trouble if they all arrive in the Northern Empire simultaneously. However, Erzin reveals that he already addressed this issue by informing the king beforehand. Craven elaborates, stating that he likely arranged for the other knights to be apprehended and detained before they could flee. Erzin recounts attending the royal party with his company and observing everything that unfolded, including Anur giving the Emperor of the Western Empire a hard time. He sarcastically remarks on her growth, noting her adeptness at using her head. Annoyed by his tone, Anur threatens to give him a beating if he doesn't stop. She advises him to conclude his business and return to the Western Empire. Erzin reassures Anur that he will indeed return to the Western Empire. Anur, 
feeling relieved that Erzin seems to be the less unpredictable one, is interrupted as Erzin presents a condition, she must return to the Western Empire as well. Anur is completely shocked by Erzin's unexpected demand. Erzin adds that he's aware Anur didn't plan to stay in the Northern Empire for long, believing she sees it as merely a vacation. Craven, taken aback by Erzin's revelation, asks Anur if it's true. Anur admits she's still contemplating her decision. Erzin hands a paper to Anur, inquiring if she plans to purchase all the items he brought. If so, he requests her to sign the receipt. Meanwhile, Alex advises Cashin to directly ask the Grand Duchess Anur about what occurred at the banquet. However, Cashin ignores the suggestion, not wanting to trouble Anur in any way. As Cashin strolls along a balcony, he spots Anur engaged in conversation with Erzin. Curious. Cashin wonders who Erzin is and why he's gazing at Anur with such gentle eyes. Before departing, Erzin informs Anur that he'll catch up with her later, prompting Anur to warn him against it. Erzin playfully teases Anur, asking if her heart flutters whenever she sees him. Their banner escalates into bickering just as Cashin approaches them. Erzin then notices Cashin, who has a dark expression on his face. He informs Anur that he will be leaving now for real, before leaving. Erzin smirks at Cashin, who stood there silently. After Erzin left the scene, Cashin approaches Anur and held her with his hand. Despite intending to inquire about what occurred in the Imperial Palace that day, Cashin finds himself unable to control his words and instead asks Anur who the man was that she was with just now. Anur is taken aback by Cashin's sudden question. Anur informs Cashin that the man was just a merchant from the Western Empire. Flustered by Cashin's proximity, she begins to feel uneasy. Sensing the tension, Craven intervenes and suggests that Cashin give Anur some space before engaging in a conversation. Sensing Anur's unease, Cashin offers her an apology for his rudeness, acknowledging that it's the first time he's seen her so close to a stranger. Anur reflects on how unusual it is to see Cashin behave this way. Cashin continues, noting that Anur rarely displays such expressions, and asks if the merchant had offended her in any way. Anur replies in the negative, indicating that the merchant hadn't offended her. Anur inquires if Cashin isn't usually working at this time. Cashin confirms this, but then Anur asks why he came here. Blushing, Cashin gently touches Anur's face and admits that he suddenly missed her very much. Cashin then asks if Anur felt troubled by his sudden appearance. Anur responds, stating that she did feel somewhat awkward when he suddenly showed up. Cashin jokingly tells Anur that if that's the case, he'll make her even more awkward by returning whenever he misses her. Anur warns Cashin not to do so, threatening to scold him if he does. She then advises Cashin to return to work, to which he assures her that he will. Craven, witnessing their sweet exchange, can't help but think that their relationship is lovely. Later, Cashin returns to his office, where Alex greets him eagerly. Alex asks if Cashin had asked Anur about what happened at the banquet, but Cashin says he hadn't. Instead, Cashin suggests they uncover the truth about the banquet by getting information from the Emperor's aides they're bound to find a clue. Cashin then tells Alex that he has something for him to investigate. He instructs Alex to look into the merchant who visited the mansion today and contact the three kings of the Western Empire. He continues by telling him that he should also investigate Rulgosa, the sword master and the Grand Duchess Anur. The scene shifts to the West Gold Guild, where a young aristocrat suddenly appears and takes over the guild. Thanks to Erzin and his exceptional business skills, the West Gold Guild, which had been suffering losses for 100 years, experiences a miraculous turnaround. Under Erzin's leadership, the guild achieves double success, marking its first profit since its founding. The guild members rejoice as they celebrate this newfound prosperity. Erzin arrives at his guild, where the butler informs him that a guest will be arriving in the afternoon. With a bright smile on his face, Erzin tells the butler that he's feeling a bit tired today and plans to rest. The butler assures Erzin that he'll convey his message to the guest and advises him to take a break. As Erzin heads inside the guild, the butler wonders if something good happened to him, noticing his smile. Inside the guild, Erzin sits at a table and reflects on Anur. He remembers how he initially thought she was lying when she announced her marriage, but now he realizes it's real. Reminiscing about Cashin, Erzin tells himself that if he had known Anur would marry someone like him, he wouldn't have allowed it. However, 
he acknowledges that it's beyond his control. Erzin believes that a nerd deserves to marry someone better and kinder, as the Grand Duke of Terran Eugene doesn't suit her at all. The next day, Anor reminisces about her godmother, who suggested analyzing and experiencing others' tea parties before organizing one. She realizes that's why she's attending one right now. Anor wonders why Erzin is also present at the tea party. Erzin addresses the ladies, stating that he'd like to recommend a product to them. He presents a whitening cream, popular in Western countries, and claims its effectiveness by pointing to his own face. Excited by the cream's potential, the ladies start placing pre-orders. Meanwhile, Anor remains silent with a dark expression on her face, observing Erzin, while Craven considers buying one as well. Erzin informs the ladies that he'll fetch more goods for them, and mentions borrowing Craven's help to carry them. Craven argues with Erzin, insisting that he needs to remain by Anur's side at all times, suggesting Erzin take someone else instead. However, Erzin dismisses the idea, stating that it's unnecessary as Anur is already strong enough. Just then, a lady approaches Anur and invites her to join them for tea, urging her to try some cookies as well. Anur couldn't help but notice that the atmosphere feels different from the last party. As she enjoys the bakery, another lady asks if the food is to her liking to which Anor replies affirmatively, wondering why all the ladies are talking so much. As they converse, Anor notices a dog angrily barking towards her. The ladies are horrified and wonder who let the dog loose. As the dog approaches, one of the ladies falls down in fear, unable to move as her legs have gone numb. The dog, now in an aggressive frenzy, charges towards the fallen lady, ready to attack. Anur swiftly realizes the danger and reacts quickly by throwing a plate to hit the dog, saving the fallen lady. The other ladies are shocked by Anur's incredible reflexes, seeing her react like a goddess. As the dog turns its attention towards Anur, growling with intense anger, Anur locks eyes with the dog and realizes something is wrong it's been drugged by someone. With a resigned acceptance, Anur closes her eyes, knowing she must face the danger head on. As the dog approaches her, its angry expression suddenly shifts to fear upon encountering Anur's ominous aura, reminiscent of an aggressive tiger ready to hunt. The dog begins to shiver upon encountering Anur's ominous aura. Anur commands the dog to sit, and surprisingly, it obeys. She then orders it to stand, and again, the dog complies. The ladies, puzzled by what they've witnessed, wonder how the dog suddenly calmed down and obeyed Anur's commands. While the other ladies praise Anur for her bravery, a woman behind her anxiously bites her nails and questions how the situation unfolded. She then warns the other two ladies to keep today's events a secret. Suddenly, Erzin approaches the group and inquires why they're huddled in a corner. The red-haired woman informs Erzin that they need to have a private conversation. Erzin notices the red-haired lady and realizes she's close to Lady Haley, identifying her as Rosanna. Rosanna then informs Erzin that they're leaving, while secretly pondering Erzin's identity. As the ladies depart, Erzin can't help but smile, finding the situation increasingly intriguing. As it turns out, Rosanna and Haley have been close friends since childhood. While Haley comes from a high status, Rosanna's status is lower. If Haley were to become the Grand Duchess, she would gain a noble status just below the Imperial family. Rosanna had hoped for Haley to marry Cashin, believing it would fulfill her wishes. However, at a certain tea party, Rosanna receives the news that Cashin is marrying a princess from the Western Empire. One lady in particular questions what will happen to Lady Haley now, causing Rosanna to visibly display frustration by clenching her hand. In another incident, at a tea party where young ladies of the Northern Empire gathered, the Marquis of Milasinov purposely shunned Anur to embarrass her. However, recently, after witnessing Anur confront the Emperor in person, the ladies of the Northern Empire began to take an interest in her. At the royal banquet, one lady praises Anur, admiring her cool demeanor, while another expresses a desire to get to know Anur better. Witnessing this, Rosanna approaches the ladies and angrily questions why they're behaving this way when Haley hasn't even recovered from the shock. However, the ladies respond by asserting that it's their choice to befriend Anur. They also blame Haley for developing feelings for a married man. Rosanna falls silent after hearing their remarks, angrily glaring at them in response. In the present, during the tea party Anur is attending, Rosanna decides to release a specially trained hound. She tells the ladies that she doesn't know why her plan failed, but they're not allowed to tell anyone else about it. Angrily, she decides to wait for the next opportunity, 
planning to strike Anor when she has a good chance. Later, at the Terran Eugene mansion, Anor's nanny anxiously asks the physician if he examined Anor thoroughly. The physician reassures her that he did and confirms Anor is in good health. Anna, another servant, chimes in and insists that the physician examine Anor carefully, not just give her a quick look over. The physician assures Anna that he examined Anor properly. Anna then turns to Craven and questions why he didn't protect Anor if he was with her. Another maid joins in, asking Craven what he was doing when Anor was attacked by the wild hound, and questioning if he still considers himself a guardian knight. Craven, with tears visible in his eyes, turns to Anor and pleads for her help. Anor then calls everyone's attention, announcing that she has an important revelation to make. She urges them to calm down and listen carefully. Anor reveals that she's actually very healthy, meaning she's not weak at all. The maids are shocked to hear this. Anor continues, stating that she can run faster than anyone, climb trees, and even lift heavy objects. The maids express their skepticism towards Anor's words, questioning if she has been fooling them all this time. Anor responds by acknowledging their feelings of betrayal, stating that she understands if they feel that way. She admits to feeling bad for tricking them and decides to reveal the truth to set things straight. Anor thinks to herself that everyone must be disappointed in her, but she realizes it's her responsibility to tell them the truth. Suddenly, Anor's thoughts are interrupted by Anna, who tells her that it doesn't matter if she has been lying all this time. Their love for her won't change. Anor is taken aback by Anna's unexpected positive remark. Another maid chimes in and tells Anor that they feel more at ease now, knowing that she's not weak. They admit they were worried because of the rumors about her bad health. Shocked, Anor questions if they truly understand the situation and have accepted her so quickly. She wonders if her efforts in pretending to be weak was for nothing. Just then, Kashin arrives at the scene and calls out to Anur, visibly worried. As Anur turns to look at him, Kashin suddenly hugs her. This unexpected gesture causes Anur to blush, and the maids, along with Craven, witnessing such a lovely sight, are also in awe of Kashin's unexpected display of affection. Kashin tells Anur that he heard about what happened at the tea party and asks if she's alright. Anur assures him that she's fine. Kashin then asks if she tried to save another lady by blocking the hound's path and if she's injured anywhere. Anur replies that she's not injured. Kashin warns Anur to never take such a risk again, to which Anur agrees. Anur realizes that Kashin sees her as fragile and weak. She thinks it's important to be honest with Kashin and show him that she's not fragile. Anur then told Kashin that there is something she wanted to tell him. Kashin encouraged her to go ahead and say it. With a little hesitation, Anur told Kashin that she's extremely healthy. Kashin just smiled at her and told her, that's nice to know. Anur, with a serious expression, further told Kashin that she's very strong as well. Kashin looked at Anur for a moment, then smiled kindly at her and told her that she's right. She's much stronger than anyone else he knows. Anur, on the other hand, was shocked as she realized that Kashin interpreted everything she said in a different way. Kashin then advises Anur to take a rest, noticing that she looks tired. Anur questions why Kashin can't understand her when he's usually very perceptive. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Kashin requests Anur to stay by his side forever. But Anur doesn't seem to understand what Kashin meant. With a cheerful smile on his face, Kashin tells her that she's the only family he has in this world. After some time, Anur accompanied by Erzin, was playing with the wild hound that had attacked her previously. Anur's sword, Levitine, asked why she brought the hound with her. Anur explained that the ladies initially told her not to save the hound, but they eventually accepted him after seeing that he had been tamed by her. Erzin then asked Anur if she had named the hound, to which Anur replied that she named him Gerald. Erzin then asks Anur about Craven's whereabouts to which Anur informs him that Craven went to change the wiper cloth to help the maids with their work. Anur then questions Erzin about his presence, to which Erzin tells her that he's here to greet her. Anur tells Erzin that she knows he's here because there's something he wants to say. She further advises him not to beat around the bush and just tell her directly. Erzin, with a smile on his face, questions Anur if she's not curious about the owner's identity of this hunting dog. Anur's interest is piqued, and she asks Erzin who the owner is. Erzin teasingly questions Anur if she really wants him to tell her upfront. In response, 
Anur asks Erzin if this is not the reason he followed her to the Northern Empire. Erzin approaches Anur and tells her that he came to the Northern Empire to get his knight's pension. He further explains that he wants to show his sincerity to her while he's in the Northern Empire. Annoyed, Anur questions Erzin, asking him what he's looking at. Erzin then showed Anur an artifact, and Anur asked him if he's suggesting that what happened at the tea party was not just an ordinary accident. Erzin replied affirmatively. Anur expressed her doubt that the emperor, who had already sent her multiple assassins in the past, would suddenly do something like this. She wondered if the empress was behind it, to which Erzin replied in the negative. Anur then asks Erzin who the culprits are, to which Erzin tells her that the culprit is a cute lady who is jealous of her. Anur is taken aback after realizing that the culprit is a lady. Erzin further tells her that her husband seems to be more popular than he thought. He then asks her if she knows who Lady Haley is. He continues by telling her that if it weren't for Anur, Lady Haley would have become the Grand Duchess of Terran Eugene. Anur, visibly agitated after hearing Erzin's statement, found the current situation annoying. Erzin thinks that everything in this world is divided into annoying and less annoying. In Anur's perspective, Anur then told Erzin that there is something she wanted him to investigate. She told him to investigate why the Emperor of the North is trying to kill her. Erzin was shocked after hearing Anur's words. Anur wonders if the Emperor has found out about her identity. She finds it really strange that he sent such weak assassins to kill her. Erzin interrupts her and asks if she thinks it's her fault that the Emperor is trying to kill her. To which Anur asks him if there is any other reason. Erzin's realization deepened as he considered that Anur's ignorance might have shielded her from the harsh realities of their world until now. With a furrowed brow, he gently probed further, asking if she noticed anything peculiar during the socialite gatherings she attended. Anur shook her head, indicating she hadn't. Continuing his line of inquiry, Erzin questioned whether she had ever pondered why Kashin occupied such a prominent position in the line of succession, especially when compared to the second prince and princess Cynthia, who was Empress Focaria's daughter. Anur admitted she was completely unaware of such matters. Erzin let out a sigh of disappointment, realizing that he would need to explain everything to Anur from the beginning. With a heavy heart, he revealed to her the grim truth. The current emperor of the north had poisoned his own brother, the previous emperor, which inevitably cast suspicions of usurpation upon him. Erzin further explained that the only weakness of the current emperor lay in his brother's son, and Anur's husband, Kashin. That's why Kashin was second in line to succeed the throne, a fact that suddenly made their situation much more perilous. Erzin continued his explanation to Anur, recounting the tumultuous events following Emperor Tresson's sudden death. He told her that after Emperor Tresson's demise, the former Empress Isol also tragically ended her own life. In the chaotic aftermath, with only a young prince left, the nobles faced a dilemma. Instead of the young Kashin who was unable to speak at the time, they chose the Emperor's younger brother, the Grand Duke Gazape, to assume the throne. At that time, Grand Duke Gazape made a promise that once young Kashin grew up and became capable of ruling, he would step aside and allow Kashin to ascend the throne. However, upon assuming power, Grand Duke Gazape began purging the royal supporters of Kashin, betraying his earlier promise. Erzin continued to share with Anur, expressing his confusion about why Kashin had been spared from the purges, speculating that perhaps public sentiment at the time had favored him. He revealed that Gazape granted Kashin the title of Grand Duke and allowed him to grow up in Terran Eugene Castle. However, Erzin further disclosed that it was rumored that only Kashin's godmother and the Marquis were permitted to enter the castle. Despite its grand appearance, the castle where Kashin was raised was essentially a form of confinement, isolating him from the outside world. Erzin conveyed to Anur that the seat of the Grand Duchess she occupied was symbolic of the ongoing confrontation between the Emperor and Kashin. He admitted that he didn't understand the thoughts of the Emperor and Kashin but emphasized that her life was intricately entwined within their political calculations. Anur's expression grew somber as she came to grasp the stark reality of her position within the Northern Empire. As Anur sat alone in her room, sipping her tea, she reflected on her past experiences. She remembered how, at the young age of 16, she had bravely ventured onto the bloody battlefield with a sword in hand. She realized that her motivation for fighting wasn't solely driven by a sense of duty to defend her nation but also by a deep desire to protect the families of everyone in the Western Empire, not just her own. However, as she pondered further, 
she couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness for Cashin. She understood that he had been deprived of such experiences from the very beginning of his life. Lost in her thoughts, Anur reminisced about the moment when Cashin had earnestly asked her to stay with him forever, acknowledging her as his only family. She couldn't help but wonder about the true meaning behind his words, yet she hesitated to even hazard a guess. Just then, Anur's nanny interrupted her reverie, noticing the seriousness etched on her face and the hint of tears in her eyes. Concerned? The nanny inquired about the reason behind Anur's troubled expression. Anur, caught off guard, questioned if she truly appeared on the verge of tears. Confirming her suspicion, the nanny gently probed further, asking if something had happened to upset her. Anur remained silent, unsure of how to articulate the swirling emotions within her. In a sudden decision, Anur stood up and quietly left the room, leaving her nanny puzzled by her abrupt departure. Without receiving any response to her inquiry, the nanny could only watch as Anur disappeared from view. Moments later, Anur arrived to meet Kashin, who greeted her with a warm smile, asking if she had come to see him. Anur nodded in agreement, and with a gentle tone, she expressed to Kashin that if he ever found himself facing difficult times, he shouldn't hesitate to confide in her. She reassured him that she would always be there to offer support and comfort, and she promised to give him a comforting hug whenever he needed it. As Cashin absorbed Anur's heartfelt words and embraced her tightly, he promised to turn to her whenever he faced challenges. Anur, taken aback by the sudden display of affection, blushed deeply in response. The following day, at Terran Eugene Mansion, Anur sat with Craven and Erzin, enjoying their tea, while Cashin remained secluded in his office chamber. Meanwhile, Cashin found himself reminiscing about Anur's unexpected behavior from the previous night, pondering why she had expressed herself in such a manner. Suddenly, Alex interrupted Cashin's thoughts, informing him about the listing of West Gold's securities, and observing that Cashin had been alone with Grand Duchess Anur. Cashin's mood shifted abruptly, his agitation evident at Alex's words. As Cashin gazed out of his window, he spotted Anur in the garden, enjoying her tea time with Erzin. Erzin suddenly notices Cashin, who's angrily staring at him. He smirks menacingly, which only fuels Cashin's frustration further. Suddenly, Erzin leaned in and whispered something into Anur's ear, causing Cashin to lose his temper completely. Turning to Alex, Cashin demanded to know if he had made any progress in investigating the person he had tasked him with. Alex admitted that the investigation was still ongoing and they hadn't obtained any concrete results yet. He urged Cashin to be patient and wait a little longer. However, witnessing Erzin becoming overly familiar with Anur enraged Cashin beyond measure. He snapped, ordering Alex to hand over all his responsibilities to Grendel temporarily and to focus solely on Grand Duchess Anur from now on. Alan agrees to Cashin's directive. While standing beside Anur, Alan ponders the purpose of his role as her aide, feeling more like a watchdog disguised in aide's clothing. Suddenly, the maids arrive and caution Anur against touching the hound with her bare hands, fearing it would ruin her beautiful hands. However, Anur assures them she's fine. Erica joins the conversation, expressing her concern for Anur's well-being and advising her to avoid the sun at all costs. Meanwhile Alan, observing everything from a distance, questions his necessity in this environment. Erica then beckoned Anur to sit and offered her apple jam refreshments she had made specifically for her. Alan, observing the scene, couldn't help but wonder how Anur had managed to gain such control over the people of Terran Eugene in such a short time. He reflected on his perception of Cashin as a cold-hearted individual who kept his thoughts hidden but he never expected him to go to such lengths to keep the merchant from getting too close to Grand Duchess Anur. Alan realized that Cashin had become a different person lately, all because of Anur's influence. Suddenly, Craven whispered to Anur, asking why Alan had been by her side all morning. Anur admitted she didn't know much either, as he had just shown up out of the blue, saying he wanted to assist her. Craven doubted Alan's intentions and questioned what there was to assist with. Alan, standing a bit away, silently listened to their conversation. He sighed, realizing there was a lot of work he needed to do, and he felt like he was wasting his time here because of Anur. Just then, Anur called Alan and asked if he would like to have a snack together, to which Alan gladly accepted her proposal. After observing Anur closely, Alan noted her charming demeanor and her ability to attract people. He decided to document his observations in his personal journal, which he named Alan's journal. On day one, 
Alan wrote that Anor preferred apple jam over grape jam. On day two, he observed her fondness for flowers, finding her unexpectedly cute as she smelled them. On day three, Alan noted that Craven greeted him first for the very first time, finding him really cool. In the summary report of Alan's journal, he concluded that Anor often stretched out because she had many responsibilities, such as managing the mansion, mediating disputes among the attendants, and maintaining order. He also learned that she was extremely shy in front of strangers, but could be as self-indulgent as a cat at times. However, Alan saw her more like a leopard or a tiger than a cat. As Anor poured tea for Alan, he heard someone calling him from behind and paused. Panicked, he turned his head to look behind and found Cashin menacingly smiling. Alan tried to explain to Cashin that it was Anor's order, but Cashin cut him off and ordered him to return to his original position right away. Cashin then asked Anor if he could join her, to which Anor allowed him to. As Alan was leaving, he started to cry, feeling disappointed that he just wanted to take a sip from the tea that Anur had personally served him. A few days later, as Anur was enjoying her tea, Craven told her that, no matter how she looked at it, the surveillance Cashin put on her was the right thing to do. Anur asked him if her relationship with Ergen looked that suspicious, to which Craven replied in the affirmative. However, Anur interjected, stating that Ergen's intentions were pure, as she had asked him not to visit her for a while, and he had accepted without resisting. Craven then advised Anur to talk with Cashin directly about this matter, as their relationship was quite good. Anur agreed. Craven further told her that at first, he couldn't believe she was getting married. But now that he looked at her relationship with Cashin, he realized that there was no man in the entire world who cared about her as much as the Grand Duke Cashin did. Besides, you also have feelings for Cashin, don't you? Craven asked. Anur became quiet after hearing Craven's remark. She thought to herself that she was going to divorce Cashin after a month and a half. As Anur was about to say something, she reminisced about the time when Cashin had embraced her in his arms. She wondered why it was like this. She had been longing for a divorce, yet she kept thinking about the time she had spent with Cashin. Craven, seeing Anur's sad expression, questioned her if she was alright. Anur, tightly holding her head with her hands, asked Craven to give her some time to think, to which Craven agreed. As he moved to leave, he suddenly turned and asked her if what Ergen said was true, that she didn't intend to stay here for long from the start. Anur told him that he was right explaining that it was a marriage with the intention of divorce from the start. Shocked by Anur's answers, Craven asked her why she was doing this to herself, even though she knew her husband had genuine feelings for her. Just then, a maid arrived and informed Anur that tomorrow is the horse riding club day. It's a fancy club that only gathers expensive horses, and only rich people from the upper class can attend. Another maid chimed in, letting Anur know that there was a horse owned by Grand Duke Cashin, and she could ride that too. They also offered to give Anur some tips on horse riding to help her. Craven, after listening to the maid's proposal of helping Anur to ride, sarcastically remarked that no one could ride better than Anur, since she was the sword master. He wished luck to the maid. In the horse riding club, Anur bumped into Rosanna, who started teasing her because Anur didn't have a horse to ride. Anur noticed it wasn't a coincidence. Just then, Lady Daisy showed up and offered Anur her horse to ride instead. Anur glanced at Rosanna, who looked pretty mad at Lady Daisy. Anur realizes that she couldn't cause trouble for someone as nice as Lady Daisy. Then, out of the blue, Rosanna told Anur that their riding club had extra horses. She asked if Anur wanted to ride them. Rosanna also mentioned these horses were super fancy, not just in their club, but all over the Northern Empire. They were among the top five most famous horses around. Rosanna then instructed her servant to bring the horse. As the servant brought the horse, Anur was captivated by its beauty. Rosanna informed Anur that it's a fine horse breed, but its temperament is a bit unpredictable. That's why no one dares to get too close to it. She recounted how the horse had recently knocked down a nobleman and broken his leg. As Anur approached the horse, Rosanna challenged her, saying if she could tame it, she'd give it to her as a gift. Anur smiled and asked if all she had to do was tame it, to which Rosanna agreed. Anur then warned Rosanna that she would regret making such an offer. Suddenly, the horse snorted angrily at Anur, causing her to close her eyes. Rosanna watched eagerly, silently urging the horse to kick Anur. But in a flash, Anur opened her eyes, causing the horse to flinch in fear. The ladies standing with Rosanna were amazed. 
The horse which no one could tame, had been instantly tamed by Anur. Anur asked the horse if he wanted her as his master, and the horse agreed by nodding his head. She quickly sat on the horse and rode it, leaving Rosanna in disbelief. The other lady accompanying Rosanna advised her to calm down, reminding her that their opponent was the princess. She further advised Rosanna to stop her childish acts. However, Rosanna was in a frenzy and started shouting towards the lady. Another lady interrupted Rosanna, telling her that no matter how hard they tried to cause trouble for Anur, it wouldn't work anyway. The two ladies then urged Rosanna to stop causing trouble for Anur, as they both found Anur really cool, which further agitated Rosanna. Just then, Anur arrived with the horse she named Raven. She happily smiled at Rosanna and expressed her gratitude for the gift. Later, as Anur arrived at the Terragon mansion with Raven, Craven questioned her if she took the horse at once, to which Anur replied in the affirmative. Anur then warned Raven not to jump around and to live comfortably, as this was his new home. Craven wondered if she was planning to turn Terragon into an animal farm. Craven then asked Anur about what she said earlier about divorce and if she was really planning to get a divorce. Anur fell silent contemplating what she should say. Suddenly, Anur questioned Craven why he was asking her all these questions all of a sudden, as she thought he would approve of this the most. Craven replied by telling her that at first, when she said she would get married, he thought it was a joke. However, when she really got married, he felt frozen. Craven further stated that she had told him to fill the void after she left but he couldn't do it because there was no one more suitable than her for that position. That's the reason Craven followed her to the North Empire. Craven revealed that he couldn't understand it at first. An outstanding person like her living an ordinary life, but after getting used to living here, suddenly he had some thoughts. The destiny of the Western Empire was hanging on Anor's shoulders alone. It was strange how the previous freedoms that Anor was deprived of had suddenly reappeared in the past without them even knowing it. Craven then asked Anor if it wouldn't be better to live like this here as long as she wants to. He told her that it's okay to be selfish, as the people of this mansion really love her, and she also looks comfortable in this environment. As Anor was about to say something, Craven interrupted her, asking her if it was really necessary for her to get a divorce. Anur didn't say anything in response. Anur thought to herself that she couldn't pretend she didn't see the Western Empire, and the flames of war that broke out between the Eastern Kingdom just ten years ago still remained, so, she didn't know when the Western Empire would become dangerous again. Anur patted Craven and thanked him for his consideration. Just then, the maids arrived and informed Anur that her bath was ready, so Anur moved to take her shower. Once alone, Craven sighed and questioned himself why there was suddenly talk of divorce. Just then, a basket fell down, and as Craven turned his head, he found Erica there, who questioned him about what he had just said. Realizing he was in trouble, Craven covered Erica's mouth and took her behind a tree. Craven then revealed to Erica that he was actually married. However, Erica wasn't buying that lie. Craven further told her that he wasn't lying. His wife had suddenly informed him that she wanted a divorce. Erica asked him why he was pretending to be single until now, to which Craven didn't say anything. Erica then told Craven that she would tell everyone about it. Frustrated, Craven revealed to Erica that he lied because he didn't want to make a fuss and he just wanted to protect Princess Anur. Craven pleaded with Erica to believe him just this once, to which Erica just stared at him. Meanwhile, inside Anur's room, she was conversing with a girl using a magic ball. The girl asked Anur multiple questions at the same time. She introduced herself as the former Dragon Knight and current protector of the Crown Prince, Juliana Agrain. Anur advised Juliana to ask questions one by one and not to call her captain since she was not a Golden Dragon Knight anymore. Anur expressed her desire to know the current situation of the Western Empire. Juliana told her that after Anur left, the Golden Knights, who had resigned during the reign of King Cyclian, were granted a group vacation as they had contributed to the country in the past. Anur then asked Juliana if the defense of the capital had decreased, to which Juliana replied in the affirmative. However, she reassured Anur that everything would be resolved as long as she returned after the time was up. Anur was startled after hearing her words. She asked Juliana who had told her about her marriage being only for three months, to which Juliana told Anur that the crown prince had revealed it to her. Juliana then asked Anur if she had informed the crew that she was getting married, 
to which she replied in the negative. She explained that she didn't want to start useless chaos. Suddenly, with a bang, Erica accompanied by Craven entered Anur's room. Anur told Juliana that they would talk later and cut the signal of the magic ball. She then questioned Erica about her sudden arrival. Erica, with tears in her eyes asked Anur if she was going to divorce the Duke. Anur was taken aback by the sudden question. She looked at Craven, who apologized to her for the nuisance. Anur realized that Erica wasn't going to back down at this point and asked her if she wished to swear allegiance to her. Erica was surprised after hearing Anur's words. She asked if Anur really meant it, to which Anur replied in the affirmative. As night fell at the Shillian Social Club, Cashin bumped into Ergen. Cashin remarked that these days Ergen had been in and out of the club quite often. Ergen responded by saying that his guest was a wonderful person, which was why he was able to frequent places like this. Cashin just mischievously smiled at him. Ergen then introduced himself to Cashin as the owner of the Western Gold Merchant Association. Cashin told Ergen that it wasn't a good place for greetings. Ergen wondered why Cashin was being so blatantly hostile towards him. He explained to Cashin that everything that happened in the Shillian Club was unofficial and not public. With that said, he further told Cashin that it was a perfect location for greetings. Ergen then apologized to Cashin for his rudeness to which Cashin remarked that he should be sorry as his tone was very rude. Urgen's expression suddenly turned dark as he told Cashin that he hadn't anticipated that Cashin would show such interest in him, revealing that he had sent someone to inquire about him. Cashin responded by saying that his inquiry turned out to be quite interesting. Urzen questioned Cashin about what he found out about him, to which Cashin told him that his real name is Urzen Lowen Waylon, an abandoned second son of the Earl of Wales. At the age of 16, when he returned safely after participating in the alliance war between the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire, he was again abandoned by everyone. After that, there was no information about him. Cashin then asked Ergen why he came to the Northern Empire, further questioning if it was because of his wife. Ergen just smiled at him sarcastically and told Cashin that he cared about him as much as he expected. However, Cashin interrupted him and said that the timing of his arrival was not just a coincidence. Finally, Ergen revealed that he came to the Northern Empire on purpose. He asked Cashin if he didn't know about his relationship with Anur further questioning if Anur hadn't said anything yet. He mentioned that it wasn't even a secret relationship. Trying to agitate Cashin, Ergen asked if Anur thought that informing Cashin wasn't necessary. Cashin replied to Ergen that Anur hadn't said anything to him because there was nothing between Ergen and her to begin with. Erzin smirked and told Cashin that he knew Anur better than him. Cashin fell silent after hearing his words, thinking it was impossible for him to forget how Erzin gently looked at Anur every time they met. The servants witnessing the entire scene from a distance couldn't help but fear that a fight might break out between Cashin and Erzin. Just then, a butler arrived informing Erzin that his VIP guests were calling him. Before leaving, Erzin teasingly smiled at Cashin and bid his farewell. As Erzin was leaving, Alan arrived and asked Cashin what happened. Cashin responded by asking Alan if the investigation into the West Gold Merchant Association was still ongoing. Alan told him that there was a lot of information to check, so it would take some more time. Cashin questioned Alan about what was happening in the Western Empire. Alan told him that suddenly all the royal engineering team of the Western Empire went on leave. Hearing this, Cashin wondered what the Emperor was thinking. Cashin then asked Alan about Mackenzie. Alan told him that the second prince, Mackenzie, was returning to the palace when he suddenly changed direction to the west. Alan stated that perhaps Emperor Gazape had revealed a secret to him. Cashin turned and started to move away. Alan then told Cashin that even if he was loyal to the emperor, the throne would eventually belong to the crown prince. Just then, Cashin spotted Count Thessalaka who told him that he had just returned from Earl Belonger's place. Cashin expressed his surprise and told him that he didn't know Thessalaka was hanging out with them. Thessalaka told Cashin that it would have been much better if he had also come with him. Count Thessalaka then sighed and informed Cashin that an official report had been sent to the Royal Police Department that Lady Daisy, Earl Belonger's daughter, had gone missing. The next day, Anor was, as always, enjoying her tea while Craven was keeping a close eye on Erica to prevent her from discussing the divorce with anyone. 
Erica then informed Anur that the tea party scheduled for tomorrow had been cancelled due to internal circumstances. Anur was surprised to hear this news, since Daisy had insisted so much that she attend the party. Anur asked Erica if something had happened to Daisy, to which Erica replied that she had heard Lady Daisy was feeling unwell. Finding the situation very strange, Anur decided to visit Daisy to see how she was doing. Later, as Anur was about to leave to meet Daisy, Cashin asked her where she was going. She told him that there was a place she needed to go. Cashin fell silent as he remembered what Ergen had told him about his and Anur's past relationship. Building his courage, Cashin asked her if she was hiding something from him. Anur replied in the negative, but Cashin persisted, mentioning Ergen. He explained that she seemed very close to Ergen and asked if he was her ex-lover. Anur was at a loss for words after hearing Cashin's questions. She told Cashin that her relationship with Ergen was absolutely not like that. Cashin then asked her to tell him what relationship she had with Ergen. Anur wondered what Ergen had done that made Cashin suddenly question her. She explained to Cashin that she had a kind of relationship with Ergen that made the idiotic second son of the Countess roll over in order to make him come to his senses. Cashin looked at her and asked if it was like a teacher-student relationship, to which Anur agreed. Cashin sighed in relief, and Anur, in her mind, told Ergen that she wouldn't let him go without punishment this time. After some time, Anur arrived at the Belonger's mansion, where she met Daisy's mother. The Countess apologized to Anur for the sudden cancellation of the tea party, explaining that Daisy was very ill and couldn't even get up. She further informed Anur that she couldn't meet Daisy right now due to the contagious nature of the disease as she might also get ill. Anur expressed her hopes for Daisy's quick recovery. The Countess then bowed and excused herself, Despite the Countess seeming genuinely sad, Anur couldn't shake off the feeling that something was definitely wrong. Just then, someone called Anur from behind, and as she turned to see who it was, she found Lady Lillian. Lillian asked Anur if she had come to meet Daisy, to which Anur replied affirmatively. Lillian told Anur that Daisy would be really happy to see her, but Anur explained that Daisy was ill, and no one was allowed to visit her. Lillian then asked Anur if she would like to have a cup of tea together. Anur contemplated her decision, as she had told Cashin that she would be back in a while. Sensing Anur's hesitation, Lillian sadly told her that it was fine if she didn't want to. However, Anur cheerfully asked her if she knew of any good tea house locations, to which Lillian replied affirmatively. After some time, Anur and Lillian arrived at the tea shop. As they were about to go inside, Anur suddenly felt someone's gaze. Turning to look, she found a lady in a hood suspiciously glancing around. Anur recognized the lady as the one who had tried to feed her poison wine at the tea party. Wondering what she was trying to do, Anur found the situation suspicious and decided to follow her. She told Lillian to stay there for a while as she had some urgent business to attend to. Moving towards the corner where the lady was standing, Anur found no one there, realizing she had lost track of her. Wondering where she could have gone, Anur suddenly heard Lillian scream. Looking back, she saw some suspicious men kidnapping Lillian. She ran towards the carriage which started to move. Anur contemplated whether she should report this and bring people to investigate, but quickly brushed off the thought, fearing she would lose their trail. With no other choice, Anur smiled and called her sword, Nevermore, before starting to follow the carriage, determined not to let them escape. As night fell, Erica, with tears in her eyes, informed Cashin that Anur had gotten lost. Puzzled, Cashin asked Erica what she meant. Erica explained that more than an hour had passed, and despite her efforts to find Anur, she was nowhere to be found. Cashin fell silent, recalling Anur's assurance that she would be back soon. He then asked Erica where Anur had gone that morning. Erica replied that she had gone to Earl Belonger's to visit Lady Daisy. Cashin was shocked by Erica's response, feeling a sense of annoyance. Meanwhile, in the capital city, Anur continued following the carriage. Suddenly, she noticed the carriage's surroundings changing shape, realizing it was due to magic. Her sword, Nevermore, questioned why a magician would be involved with criminals. Anur also expressed doubt, noting that the basic pension from the magician tower was far better than working with criminals like this. Suddenly, Anur realized that the carriage seemed to be heading toward the forest. Nevermore asked Anur if she still intended to follow the carriage. Anur affirmed her decision, explaining that even though she was a gentlewoman she would not pretend to be oblivious and let the criminals go unchecked. The scene then shifted to Thessalaka's mansion, where Thessalaka, Cashin, and Alan were searching for something. 
Thessalaka glanced at Kashin, who appeared tense. He wondered if Kashin's marriage with Anor was arranged. The moment he heard of Anor's disappearance, Kashin had stayed up all night searching for her. Thessalaka found it hard to believe that Kashin's marriage was arranged. Thessalaka remarked that if they continued to investigate like this, they would find no clues. They had been searching for the past few days, but had made no progress. It was clear that something suspicious was going on. Even those who witnessed the kidnapping couldn't remember anything. Their words were vague. Surely there must be something, but it was impossible to be satisfied with such unknowns. Kashin then instructed Thessalaka to keep Anor's disappearance a secret. He explained that if the Emperor or the Western Empire were to interfere, the situation would only become more complicated. He then told Thessalaka to immediately call the suspect who had contacted Anur. After some time, in the investigation room, Kashin sat with Erzin, who had handcuffs on his hands. Erzin questioned Kashin about why he was holding him captive like this, even though he hadn't been declared guilty yet. Kashin replied that they would question him, and then they would know if he was guilty or not. Erzin chuckled and reassured Kashin that Anur would be fine. Kashin questioned how Erzin could be so sure. Teasingly, Erzin replied that he knew Anur better than Kashin did. Kashin's anger flared at Erzin's casual attitude. He demanded to know what Erzin knew that made him so confident about the situation. Erzin explained that Anur was the most amazing and strongest girl he had ever known, which was why he believed she would be okay. With a cold expression, Kashin warned Erzin to hope that Anur would indeed be okay. He made it clear that if anything had happened to her, he would ensure Erzin wouldn't be at ease either. Meanwhile, Craven raced through the forest in search of Anur. Evermore, the sword sensed Anur's power nearby and urged Craven to hurry. Exhausted, Craven asked Evermore if they were heading in the right direction, having been running since morning. Evermore curtly instructed him to continue, reminding him that he was just her servant. Despite his exhaustion, Craven pressed on in the direction Evermore indicated, until he suddenly halted, sensing something amiss. The scene then shifted to six hours earlier, when Anor was searching for the carriage in the forest. After it disappeared using illusion magic, Nevermore warned her that crossing the barrier would alert the magician who set it up. Anur debated wiping her traces to avoid detection, but feared harming Lillian in the process. Instead, she resolved to infiltrate the barrier carefully. She planned to find a gap in the fence and then send Nevermore back to avoid detection. With determination, Anur cut through the barrier and instructed Nevermore to retreat before entering herself. As Anur successfully entered the barrier, she spotted two men guarding a cave ahead. She contemplated whether to confront the guards directly, but hesitated, fearing potential complications. Suddenly, she felt something brushing against her foot and discovered a squirrel nearby. An idea sparked in Anur's mind, and she decided to use the squirrel to her advantage. With a smirk, Anur grabbed an acorn and tossed it in the direction of the guards. Intrigued, the squirrel followed the acorn, drawing the attention of the guards and providing Anur with the perfect distraction. Seizing the opportunity, Anur swiftly infiltrated past the distracted guards, using the commotion caused by the squirrel to her advantage. Upon entering the cave, Anur heard a voice pleading for help. She approached the nearby cell and found a small girl begging Anur for assistance. Realizing that the cave was a hideout for slave traders and that they had even kidnapped children, Anur felt anger surge within her. Determined to rescue the captives, she silently signaled to the child to remain quiet before continuing her exploration. Moving further into the cave, Anur was shocked to discover Daisy and Lillian trapped in a cell. Lillian questioned Anur's presence, wondering if she too had been kidnapped. Anur was taken aback by their presence. Suddenly, a magician appeared behind Anur and inquired if she was a member of the police. Without waiting for a response, the magician created a magic circle beneath Anur's feet, declaring that she could not leave the area. Anur began to feel dizzy and attempted to call upon Nevermore, but she lost consciousness before she could do so. As Anur lay unconscious, her consciousness drifted into another dimension, where she encountered memories of her past. In one memory, she was a young girl asking her uncle how a talking sword was possible. Her uncle laughed at her innocence, but Anur persisted, asking how she could use the sword herself. 
Her uncle demonstrated, swinging the sword with a magical aura surrounding it. Anor was captivated by the beauty of the aura and expressed her desire to play with the sword too. Her uncle affectionately patted her head and assured her that she could play with the sword whenever she wanted, as she was just like him. Reflecting on this memory, Anor realized that her love for wielding her sword stemmed from this early connection. She resolved not to care what others thought of her and to stand up for herself against anyone who dared to challenge her regardless of their seniority or status. As Anur regained consciousness, she felt a sharp pain in her head, realizing it was caused by the disorienting effects of the welcoming magic, which can cloud the mind and rob an individual of his will. Anur then summons Nevermore, who argues with Anur as she throws her coldly earlier, and now summons her again when she needs her. Nevermore then advises Anur to not let her body go numb, as she can't forgive anyone who harms her. Just then, the mage arrived and questioned Anur how she woke up from the welcoming magic. Anur, determined and with Nevermore in hand, prepared to attack. However, the mage mocked her, feigning fear. He explained that the cell rods had special magic on them, making them indestructible. Yet, with a single strike of her sword, Anur effortlessly shattered the cell rods. Anur smiled at the mage and declared that his magic was now useless. The mage, shocked by Anur's power, asked how she managed to escape. He then ordered his guards to gather, pondering if Anur could be the one possessing the hidden power rumored in the Northern Empire. Anur, sensing his fear, pointed her sword at the mage. Frightened, the mage warned Anur that she didn't know who was supporting him. However, Anur tells the mage that she couldn't care less, as she already knows that an organization like this will definitely have a backer. She further warned the mage that if he won't talk, she will just kill him, which scared the mage. He told her to wait, and suddenly orders his guards to attack. Yet, Anur swiftly defeated all the enemies without breaking a sweat. As Craven dashed through the forest searching for Anur, he stumbled upon a group of people locking others into a cart. He realized they were slave traders. Among them, he noticed a heavily bandaged man and wondered about his identity and why they were in such a hurry. Intrigued, he decided to follow them. However, his attention was suddenly drawn to a purple light emanating from a nearby mountain. Before he could process it, a massive explosion occurred, and Anor emerged from it. She questioned how he arrived at the right time, and Craven credited Evermore's constant bickering. Craven informed Anor about his attempt to pursue the slave traders but understood why they fled upon witnessing the explosion. Anur asked if he had seen the bandaged man, and Craven confirmed his recent presence. She explained that during her skirmish with the guards, she had also noticed him, feeling uneasy in his presence. She regretted not examining him more closely and pondered their purpose in that place. As the security team arrives, Anur calls back Nevermore and tells Craven that she's relying on him again. Perplexed, he inquired why, just as the security team closed in on them. Craven asked Anur what they should do. Anur, with a sinister grin, assured him that, like in the past, he had already taken care of everything on his own. The following day brought news confirming the destruction of the slave trader's hideout and the successful rescue of the captured individuals. Predictably, Craven was hailed as the hero behind these accomplishments, receiving applause and praise from the people. However, rather than basking in the glory, Craven felt further embarrassed by the attention, especially when he noticed Ergen among the crowds, smiling at him, which only served to agitate him more. Meanwhile, at the Terran Eugene mansion, Anor perused the newspaper and stumbled upon an article detailing the mysterious death of a magician who had been aiding criminals in prison. Anor expected the defense security team to delve deeper into the matter, but she discovered they were only harboring suspicions. Reflecting on the events of the previous night, Anur wondered why Kashin had worn such a sour expression upon her return to the mansion. As Anur immersed herself in the newspaper, Kashin observed her from a nearby building window, lost in his thoughts. Since childhood, he had found the world uninteresting, believing that inheriting the throne was merely a matter of birthright rather than earn merit. Despite having support from loyal generals on both his father and mother's sides, Emperor Gazape showed little interest in him, leaving Kashin feeling insignificant. He had always restrained himself, navigating life's complexities with caution and calculation, ensuring harm befell his enemies while sparing the kind-hearted. He finds everything so easy that it started getting boring. However, Anor's arrival disrupted his sense of boredom. He couldn't help but be drawn to her 
questioning why he felt such a keen interest in her and why he had chosen her as his betrothed. As Kashin gazed sadly at Anur, his mind drifted back to the moment he received the news of her disappearance. An overwhelming sense of anxiety consumed him, stirring a frenzy of emotions within him. For the first time in his life, he felt as though he were teetering on the brink of madness, willing to sacrifice anything to ensure her safe return. His every thought was consumed by the fervent hope for Anor's well-being. Then, when word reached him of her eventual return, a surge of emotion flooded through Kashin. In that moment, his heart seemed to awaken from a long slumber, and he realized with startling clarity that he was unconditionally and irrevocably in love with Anur. He yearned for her presence, craving every facet of her being the sparkle in her eyes, the warmth of her smile he wanted all of her, and the mere thought of losing her again was unbearable to him. Kashin knew then that his love for Anur was profound and unwavering, a force that consumed him entirely. As Kashin noticed Anur waving at him, he couldn't help but return the gesture with a happy wave of his own. The following day, at the royal police station, Thessalaka called Kashin to inform him about the discovery of the bodies of the human traffickers. Thessalaka urged Kashin to join him and listen to the insights they had gathered, to which Kashin readily agreed. Inside the room, Kashin met Daisy and Lillian, who explained that they couldn't recall the events leading to their capture. Lillian mentioned meeting Anor as the only memory she could hold on to. Kashin realized that their memories were fragmented, hindering any meaningful progress in the investigation. As the servant called for the next eyewitness, a timid young girl entered the room hesitantly. The police had questioned her about what she remembered from the events in the cave. With a radiant smile, the girl affirmed that she recalled encountering a stunning girl with red eyes and silver hair who had promised to save her. Kashin was taken aback by her words, struck by their significance. Just then, a servant interrupted Kashin and handed him an investigation report that had just arrived, confirmed by the defense team and containing information from the Western Imperial Intelligence. As Kashin read through the report, he found himself startled by its contents. Meanwhile, in the Western Empire, the Emperor perused the news detailing the unidentified kidnappings in the Northern Empire, along with reports of a swordmaster who had single-handedly rescued the victims. Recognizing the unmistakable handiwork of Anur, the Emperor couldn't help but feel a mix of admiration and concern. As he delved deeper into the report, he learned of Grand Duke Kashin's apparent devotion to Grand Duchess Anur, going so far as to confine her indoors due to her purported per health. The Emperor found this situation peculiar, yet he couldn't deny the bond between them. Despite his reservations, he held on to hope that Anor would eventually return to the Western Empire. The Emperor mused on Anor's steadfast commitment to her beliefs and her selfless nature, devoid of any lust for power. He understood that her unwavering dedication to protecting the Empire stemmed from her love for her family. Sighing heavily, he burned the investigation report, realizing the need to facilitate a change that would pave the way for Anor's return. Determined to create a path for her to come back, the Emperor resolved to take action. As Kashin sat quietly in his office, solitude enveloping him, his mind wandered back to the moment he received the investigation report. It shattered his perception, revealing that the true sword master and leader of the Golden Knights was none other than the daughter of the Friedrich family someone with red eyes and silver hair. The revelation left Kashin reeling in shock. Memories flooded his mind of their first encounter, recalling how effortlessly she leaped from balcony to balcony. Even after their marriage, he remembered her scaling tall trees with ease. Kashin thinks about Anur, that despite getting caught up in countless troubles, she's always been okay with everything. She always gets caught up in the heart of the problem. But he realizes that it doesn't matter as he finally knows who she is. After a while, Kashin approached Anur and asked her to drink the juice he brought for her. He secretly thought to himself that if Anur didn't tell him the truth, he would make her drink it by force. Anur questioned why she needed to drink the juice, to which Kashin replied that she was very weak and that drinking it would make her strong. Anur, holding the glass of juice, felt uneasy about it. She glanced at Kashin, who was smiling, and reluctantly drank it all at once, only to find it extremely bitter. Meanwhile, Kashin, observing her, thought she was still as lovely as before. Kashin then instructed Anur to drink this juice three times a day, which frightened her. She explained to him that if she consumed it three times a day, she would die within a month. However, Kashin remained undeterred. Anur, realizing she needed to assert her strength to Kashin, 
called him over and insisted that she was extremely healthy and stronger than he believed. Cashin, in response, assured her that he was already aware of her strength. He then mentioned to Anur that he had something to share with her. Curious, Anur asked what it was. With a cheerful smile, Cashin revealed that delegations from the Western Empire would be visiting. And that's a wrap for season 1 of this manhwa. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to stay tuned for the next season, arriving tomorrow. Thank you for your support.